This is my channel's monthly compendium for the month of March 2023. Case file number 997, written by Smeet Pro, The Ancient Neolithic Time Anomaly. To set the scene, the back of my house borders a forest. The area was frequented by Neolithic people as there are monuments nearby and a funerary urn was found about 5 meters from my backyard. It's a place where druids would have performed rituals and ceremonies. Anyway, I'm hanging up washing one day with my mind wandering off to all kinds of things rather than concentrating on the mundane chore. I'm listening to the birds, the wind and the trees and thinking what a lovely warm day it is. My eye then catches a crow landing about a meter in front of me, but the thing is, it's landing in slow motion. I'm looking at this black bird, slowly landing on the ground with its wings outstretched, and then I realize it is deadly silent. No birds chirping, no wind, no washing flapping in the breeze, nothing. I snap out of my daydreaming and concentrate on what's going on. The sight of the slow motion bird and the silence sends my head into a spin. Am I having a heart attack? Am I alive? Are things slowing down because I'm about to pass out? What's going on? I let go of the peg in my hand and watch as it slowly falls to the floor, like a balloon in slow motion. I start looking all around me and everything has become still. The trees aren't moving, but my head and arms are moving like normal. I'm looking at the sky, clouds, trees and all around me and even the house's chimney vent, which always spins is still as death. It feels like time has stopped, but the weirdest thing is the silence, just nothing, no noise, no sound, just nothingness. I look back at the bird, still stunned at what is happening, and suddenly a wall of sound hits me. The bird's chirping, wind in the trees, the flapping wings of the crow as it takes off again, and a strange white noise which must just be ambient sounds. Everything sounds loud and clear, I stand there for about 5 minutes trying to wrap my head around what happened, looking around in disbelief. My heart rate is normal, I feel just fine, in fact I feel pretty good, like I've just had some kind of out of body experience. The whole thing must have been less than a minute, like time lagged and then suddenly caught up again. That was more than a year ago, never experiencing anything like it before or since. Would you like even more content? Here's my Patreon, now onto the stories. Case file number 998, written by Sufficient Data 9962. My mom put me to bed. When I was about 10 years old, I would go to bed at around 8.30 PM. I used to fall asleep in my mom's bed. She had a TV in her room, so I would fall asleep to cartoons. And when she would come up to go to bed, she would wake me up and take me to my bed. One night, I was sleeping in my mom's bed as usual, and I woke up to the door opening. I didn't wake up to look at who it was, because I figured it was my mom. It was just me and her living at our house. I heard her walk towards the bed and then stop. It was a good five minutes before I heard the bed creak from her laying down. She laid down and put her arm around me. She never said anything, and neither did I, since I was half asleep. She didn't wake me up to move me to my room, so I just figured she was letting me sleep in her room that night. I drifted off. When I woke in the morning, I rolled over and saw my mom was gone. I walked downstairs and saw her sleeping on the couch. The title screen for Pretty in Pink was playing on the TV in the background. She woke up and smiled and asked me what I wanted for breakfast. I told her I'd just make myself a bowl of cereal. I headed to the kitchen and turned around to thank her for letting me sleep in her bed last night. She looked at me confused and said, you didn't sleep in your room? I told her no. She said she fell asleep on the couch. I said no, you came in the room last night. She looked at me even more puzzled and said no, I've been down here the whole time. I kept telling her no, you laid down next to me and I even remember you putting your arm around me and stroking my hair. She looked horrified. Again, we lived alone. My mom has no history of sleepwalking either. To this day, my mom and I are still freaked out by this and don't really like to talk about it. Never happened again. Never had any other paranormal activity in the house either. Bonus file, written by Accomplished Work, 454, The Cuyahoga Valley Shadow Monster. I'm from Ohio in the United States. When I was in fourth grade, 10 years old, 19 now, 
Me and my buddies were out in the woods behind my buddy's house. We were always back there growing up. There was a creek we would hop over, and just on the other side was a farm with some horses. One day, we had just jumped over the creek, but were still in the woods right by the creek. That's when we heard what sounded like a little girl screaming at the top of her lungs. Being young kids, we all just froze, thinking it was odd to hear such a vibrant scream in the middle of the day. About 5 to 10 seconds later, right in front of us, a black figure zoomed across some bushes and shrubs at lightning speed. We all looked at each other and then bolted out of the woods to my buddy's house. We were all in shock at what we just saw, and to this day we still talk about how creepy it was. It moved so fast there was no way it was human. And where I live, the only wild animals we have here are white-tailed deer, coyotes, and foxes. This thing was at least 6 to 7 feet tall and was black enough to look like a shadow or something. It didn't look like it was absorbing any light at all, or rather was absorbing so much light, it was the darkest black I've ever seen. I was just wondering if anyone else in Ohio, or the United States for that matter, has seen anything similar. I live right by the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, so maybe there have been some sightings there. But this was not in the national park, just a small patch of woods in a pretty suburban area. Case fall number 999, written by Yuramashi Yusuke. I predicted a mysterious figure would give me Spider-Man. One evening last October, I was looking up Spider-Man figures to buy and I found a really cool one with movable fingers and toes, and I really wanted to buy that figure. But since it was an older one, it was extremely expensive. That night, I had a dream where I was at school, and some dude that I had never even seen before walks into my classroom and gives me the figure for free. The next day, I was at school and I was on my spare period, and suddenly, this teacher that I had never seen before comes into the classroom. He starts pulling out a few toys out of his bag, thinking he can donate them to the local preschool. My school is partnered with the preschool. One of those toys just so happened to be that one specific Spider-Man figure, complete with movable fingers and toes, and he gave it to me, for free. I was really happy, but at the same time, really freaked out since I had a dream the night before where a dude I had never seen before walks into my classroom and gives me the figure. After that, I never saw that teacher again, however, I still have that figure on my shelf. Case file number 1000, written by Emily Yancey, when the postmaster delivers a thousandth glitch. Hello, people. I've been quietly biding my time, waiting for my glitch. Everything I'm about to describe came to light about 30 minutes ago at the time of posting this, when I, 49 female, drove to my parents, 75 female and 78 male, home, to check on my dad. He was in the ER with chest pains earlier today and had been discharged. On to the glitch. My parents do not use forums and do not know about glitches in the matrix. After the dust settled on, I said, Is that okay? My mom presented me with an envelope that was in her mailbox this week, with my writing on it. No debate. This is my writing and exactly how I would address a card to my parents, front and back, including Shirley Temple stamps for my mom. Glitch number one. Postmark is from July 2016, Los Angeles. That tracks with where I lived in July 2016, but how did it take 6.5 years to get to my parents' mailbox? Reasonable answers. The card was stuck in a postal bin or inside my parents' mailbox for 6.5 years. Okay. Then riddle me this part. Glitch 2. Yes, it's my handwriting on the envelope, but the card inside is a card I've never seen, and based on the pop culture references on the card, it is not a card I would send, and the message inside the card is my aunt's handwriting with her signature. Yes, the card that's been in transit for 6.5 years is from my mom's sister, and addressed and sent by me. Reasonable explanation. My uncle aunt's husband, my mom's brother-in-law, and my favorite uncle, could have handed it off to me for mailing when he passed through LA. This explanation isn't totally wild, because he travels a lot, and we always find a diner together, whatever locale he's passing through. However, I have zero recollection of us getting together during my seven years in LA, nor any sort of card handoff, nor any prior card handoff that seems like this 
Plus, why would my aunt in Georgia give her husband a card to give to me in California to mail to my mom in Virginia? So how did my mom receive a 6.5-year-old card mailed in my writing, but from her sister, on a day when my dad was in the hospital for a near-death experience? Also, just notice the happy birthday, Moo, makes no sense. My mom's birthday is in November. Postmarks are July 2016, so this birthday wish is 8 months late? Case file number 1001, written by Webborn2622. When a delicious brew spills itself. Me and some friends went to watch a concert at our university. As we can be expelled for drinking on school property, none of us had anything to drink. After the concert, we went to the local student bar. A friend of mine got a round of beer for everyone. This girl in my group, we'll call her Anna, got a glass of beer, but put it in the middle of the table and didn't touch it as she was occupied with a conversation. No one touched the glass, but all of a sudden it spilled all over Anna. It didn't fall and spill, it spilled upwards as if it had been put down too hard, but it had been untouched on the table for at least 5 minutes. Everyone was surprised and confused. We all agreed that no one had touched the glass and that it had been done on its own. No one had had more than a sip of beer, and there were three people who didn't drink due to religious reasons. We were all equally confused. A bar worker came over and asked Anna what happened, and she said, I have no idea. The rest of us also said we didn't understand what had happened. Someone literally said the words, a glitch in the matrix, in response to the event. Bonus file, written by Becca Penny. My husband came home without coming home. I was working at home, and my husband had gone into his office. I worked later than usual, and when I heard him arrive home, as I was about to finish, I didn't go down to greet him. I thought it was a bit odd he didn't call up to me, but figured he realized I was still working, so didn't want to disturb me. When I finished working about 20 minutes later and went downstairs, he wasn't there, so I assumed he must have popped back out for something. When he arrived back, I apologized for not coming down the first time. He looked confused and said he'd only just got back because he'd been held up. I clear as day heard the front door open and close and him dump his stuff down. I remember being pleased he'd remembered his keys because he usually forgets. Then this evening, at around the same time, my motion activated light up cat ball went off twice with no one anywhere near it. I am a huge skeptic, but it's been an odd two days. Case file number 1002. Written by Awesome and Wholesome When an alien visits the dentist I'm a dentist and I do mostly extractions at the moment. Had a patient come for one and got on it. She looked normal, healthy if anything. A bit timid, nothing out of the ordinary. During the procedure, I noticed something odd. Anesthesia is not nice, but she didn't even flinch. Doesn't hurt per se, but everybody at least blinks or at most squints their eyes, but not her. She had absolutely no reaction to it at all. Odd, I thought, but carried on with it, and during the whole ordeal, she didn't react to anything else either. Doesn't hurt, but is quite an unpleasant experience. Took a while, I had to remove a bit of bone to extract it, cut it in half and whatnot, but nothing out of the ordinary. When it was done, she got her prescription, quietly thanked me, and went on her way was then when I was cleaning up the office and instruments that I noticed they had no blood on them at all. Nothing, not a drop. I don't know how I didn't notice that she didn't bleed while I was doing it, but I didn't. The procedure involves quite a bit of blood, especially when you need to section the tooth to extract it. But she didn't bleed at all, period. Super weird considering that and the fact that she had no reaction to the procedures whatsoever. It freaked me out a bit. It happened two days ago. Case file number 1003, written by Traz O, when words are amplified beyond reasoning. This happened some years back. To this day, it makes me wonder if there's more to reality than science knows. And I'm a big fan of science. I was taking a short vacation with my fiancé and my parents. I had taken a job away from home, and they met me in the middle of our separation, at a beach motel on the east coast. We had adjoining rooms, and having just got there, the doors were open. Liz and I decided to get some ice, so we took two ice buckets and headed for the ice machine. The motel layout was linear, 
we were some distance out from the central hub area, with vending machines and ice. Exactly 23 yards and some inches from turning the corner into the vending area, I heard my father say, Where's Jim and Liz? It was like he was speaking into my ear. I turned around, but he wasn't there. My mother said just as close, They went to get ice. I looked at Liz. She'd stopped when I did. Did you hear that? She just said, How? We went back and asked my parents what they'd talked about without telling them what we'd heard. Eventually, Mom said, Wait, remember? You asked where Jim and Liz went? The scientific skeptic in me kicked in, and I inspected the spot where we'd heard them. No vents or holes for sound to travel through. I measured the distance from the room using the admittedly imprecise method of counting strides. I arranged experiments where people in the motel room standing in various locations spoke sentences, often quite loudly, but no one standing where we heard them ever heard anything again. This isn't deep or significant, except that I can't explain it at all. Creepy File number 82, written by Bonacorso de Novora, The Night Park Terrors. Here's my personal experience after walking at night in the park near my old house. It's right on the edge of the city, and while the park looks like about two square miles of wild nature, it's surrounded by the city from three sides, and with a suburban area and mall from the fourth. Thus, it's not some wild land of Bigfoot, but apparently this place has something. As always, after work, I sometimes go to this park at night. The place is safe, no animals bigger than squirrels, so nothing to worry about. This time, I decided not to walk by its trails and alleys, but to go to the distant part, where, on the bottom of a wide ravine, flows a small, about two meters wide and shallow, stream supporting local ponds. Shores are open and have some sticky black clay on them, in some parts, and a local village long ago was named Black Mud after this, but in many places, a meter or two from the shore, starts bushes and trees. I was going by this shore. Night is clear enough and no trees above the stream, so I could see without a flashlight. Nothing suspicious, only ordinary night forest sounds. Then I saw some movement behind in the bushes in front of me, where the stream turns from my shore. Here I should add that overall, while I am a bit afraid of darkness, yes it's a strange combination with night park walks, I got used to this particular park, visited for years, so almost every part is very familiar to me. Besides, it's all surrounded by civilization. So I saw some movement in those bushes, about 15 meters from me. Slowly trying not to make any sound by stepping on some crunchy branch on the shore, I walked forwards. Between the bushes, there was some free space, enough for me to get forwards in between. Behind them, there was a small meadow, and then… Here, it's hard for me to tell. My mind, since then, makes me think that I saw a dog, but I can't remember any visual of the dog. No breed, no size, nothing. I do not remember what I saw there, but what I did next is I instinctively rushed backwards to the stream took from the ground the biggest branch I could see and ran away from there, looking backwards often, but there was nothing. I stopped only on the hill for half a mile, overlooking the forested ravine bottom around the stream. It was calm and quiet. I finally dropped my stick and, confused, went home. So far I have no idea what it could be, but back then I was in panic mode for a few minutes, and then it was okay again, like an on and off switch. Case fall number 1004 Written by Stretchy Unicorn, we took a trip on a road that never existed. This happened around six years ago. My partner lived out in the countryside. Not much around but farmland, brittle ways and walking trails. The nearest shop was a petrol station which was about a 6 mile, 15 minute drive. There were only two routes from his place to the shop, and we always took the same route. We would do this drive an average of four times a week. Even when not going to the shop, but driving out to the town, etc., this route was very familiar. It was pretty much one straight road cut through the woodlands and forest. Your typical winding country lanes were for half the journey through the woodland, you would be on alert for deer randomly jumping out in front of you just to scuttle off into the woodlands on the other side. So on this night, we're doing our usual drive to get snacks and chatting about everything and nothing. But halfway through the journey, the woodland opened up a sort of crossroads that I had never seen before. 
As we approached it, my boyfriend slowed right down. A car was approaching towards us from the left and going down the road we are just leaving. It passed us as we sat there. Then my boyfriend proceeded to the right, slightly, where there was a miniature level crossing for trains. In the moments from approaching this clearing to crawling towards a level crossing, I'm looking around everywhere trying to work out where we are and looking to my boyfriend to see his reaction. At some point I quietly said, What's going on? What's this? He didn't answer me, but it's possible he just didn't hear me or didn't say anything as I wasn't asking a direct question and was thinking out loud. As we approached, my boyfriend stopped talking and focused, and I mean really focused and drove carefully and slowly. The opening of the level crossing had about 3.5 feet of heavy wooden slats, then the two rail lines, then another set of wooden slats as you left the rail tracks. He had a very low sports car and you felt every hard bump as we entered and left. The car purred over the slats and then thudded hard over the rails. He was visibly and verbally conscious and careful of every bump. As we exited, we came onto a ridiculously tight lane which was so narrow that the foliage was touching either side of the car. After perhaps 30 seconds, the lane naturally widened out and my boyfriend continued talking. I still had no idea where we were, so interrupted him with what I considered to be a rhetorical question. I said, hang on, we've never come this way before, have we? Confused, he said, eh, yeah, this is the only way we come. So we're going back and forth and he's asking how I don't recognize where we are, and our tone between each other is getting heated as we both become frustrated with one another. I eventually say how I've never seen that level crossing before. At this point he vocally stumbled on himself and very loudly said, Level crossing? What level crossing? What are you on about? This conversation is taking place as we're still driving, and after a minute, I recognize where we were, and everything was as it's always been. He goes into the shop and I stay in the car feeling frustrated and confused. Whilst he was in the shop, I'm running over our conversation in my head and slightly uncomfortable that he didn't understand what I was asking or how he didn't see the level crossing. He comes back, it's more relaxed, and I calmly insist that we must have come a different way even though that made no sense to me as the last leg of the route was the same and there's no other way to get to that particular road. To prove a point, which was irrelevant, he drove back the only other route. This confirmed to me that he had no idea what I was even asking and was clearly baffled by what I was suggesting. We got back and eventually we let it go and he laughed it off saying I imagined it or was thinking of a different place and had merged two memories together. So, over the following weeks, I scoured every single map I could find. Normal maps, ordnance surveys, Google Satellite and Google Street View, I even went on different train enthusiast websites where there are lists of every level crossing and what type of crossing they are, etc. There was no trace of it. We drove that route two days later and it was the same as it ever was. I had never seen that level crossing before and never seen it since. This area is known for the Bluebell Railway, so I even looked into old, disused railway lines, etc. I searched out everything you can think of solidly over a two week period and found nothing. I let it go for a bit and would search a few times a week, then a handful of times a month. After about four months I had solidly scoured a 30 mile radius of that entire route. I did this to try and find even an illogical and irrational answer. For instance, that perhaps there was a diversion and we didn't notice it. But that's impossible as there's nothing like that even on the longest diversions or detours. It simply didn't exist. We had been driving that route for around 3 years when this happened and continued doing it for another 2.5 years after. I knew this area incredibly well through driving around and hiking. I will never understand what happened that night. I would love to know if anyone has experienced anything similar or any suggestions as to what may have happened. Case file number 1005, written by Ellie Fakre, the brightest UFO. A few years ago, I rented my father's second property. It's pretty far back in the woods off a very small two-lane dirt road. One night I was sitting in the main room of my recliner watching YouTube with just the outside deck lights on. 
I started to get a feeling up the back of my neck, as you do when you're creeped out about something nearby or whatever. The next 10 minutes were strange. I have super blurry memories of slowly walking out the front door and down the deck steps, looking up at a giant white light floating above the cabin, and the second I looked at it, I collapsed on the bottom of the stairs and a giant, what seemed like, electric shock went through my body. I started crawling up the stairs and felt like every inch of my body was being pulled super hard back away from the front door. I don't remember if the area was lit up from the light, but it sure felt like it. The rest is a blackout, and I woke up, standing at my kitchen sink with the water running hot all over my head and all the lights on in the house. Am I crazy, or did I experience something weird? Thanks. Case file number 1006, written by Cherry Cranberries. The officer who teleported me to safety. I was telling the story to someone today. I haven't spoken about the story in many years, so I thought I might share it. This happened about 10 years ago. I was barely a 20-year-old girl living in Massachusetts. I was driving to my college at the time. I commuted to school, and this particular day was very snowy, icy, and sleeting. I don't know why school was in session, but in the Northeast, they don't take bad weather very seriously. I think we've all seen the memes of cars with piles of snow on them saying they're heading to work. That's New England for you. So anyway, I'm driving to school and I was late. The road of which I was driving on was a two-lane highway that was very steep. Between the two lanes were Jersey barriers, and the opposite flow of traffic was on the other side. Like many roads in Massachusetts, there are no shoulders, and there were no turnarounds. Once you were on the highway, you had to drive another five miles before you could pull off to the closest exit. It was a type of highway where if your car stopped, you were screwed because there's nowhere to pull off. Again, lack of shoulders and grass, just concrete barriers on both sides and barriers in the middle. It was a dangerous highway that many people had died on. Even a friend of my mom's co-worker died on it. I was driving pretty fast for the type of weather I was in. I was in the far left lane and could see a tractor trailer in the far right, but behind my car. Suddenly, my car fishtailed and I spun out completely. I was suddenly in the far right lane facing oncoming traffic. The tractor trailer was coming at me, like coming at me. There was no time or place to go. I remember this feeling came over me, like my brain didn't register what was happening. And suddenly, out of nowhere, my car is in reverse, and I was in a miracle of a small shoulder, but still facing oncoming traffic. I don't know how it happened, and I remember being in shock how I did that. The tractor trailer blew by me in seconds. I mean, I was literal toast if I didn't get into that shoulder. Breathing heavily and saying to myself, did I really just do that? Within what must have been 10 to 15 seconds, I hear a few knocks on my driver window. I know it was about 10 to 15 seconds because I had the Britney Spears song Stronger on and the car flipped at the bridge of the song and the knock came at my window at the last chorus. I opened the window and a young male police officer is now staring right at me. He then says, Hey, I saw your car spin out. I see the lights behind now and his car parked right behind me in the same small squeeze of a shoulder that ended very quickly up ahead. Clearly seeing me in what probably looked like total shock, he continued on. You were going too fast. I said, yeah, I know. And then he said in this nearly soft but direct tone, stop rushing. Why are you rushing? You need to relax, okay? Relax. It was something like that. He then says how he's going to stop the traffic so that I can turn my car around in the proper direction and get back on the road. It's fuzzy how he did it but I just remember him stopping the flow. I turned my car around out of the shoulder. Remember, my car was facing the wrong direction, so I wouldn't have been able to even turn the car around to get back on this icy and sleet busy highway and slowly pull it back onto the proper direction I was supposed to be in. I continue on and look behind me. Normally, you can see a cop pull out after you, see their lights on, or the car themselves if they turn it off, etc., but all I saw were the cars that were waiting for me now driving. It's weird to explain this, but the cop disappeared in seconds. I mean, disappeared. Like I said, there was nowhere for this cop to go. The only turnaround, the small cutout median that cops tend to use to go in different directions, wasn't for another mile ahead, 
and the first exit off wasn't for another 5 miles. The small little shoulder ended right after where I was, and this cop was nowhere to be seen. It was so weird. I remember looking back several times in the mirror and saying, where did he go, what? It was so odd I thought about it all day. I came home and told my parents what happened. Of course in shock that my car spun out in the opposite direction and I almost hit a tractor trailer. I told them exactly where this took place, how my car went into reverse in which I have no recollection of and the magical cop that showed up in 10 seconds and disappeared as fast. My own parents thought it was the strangest thing. I've told the story to a few people I know who also have called it very weird. I think, and my parents agreed, either that cop was sent by God at that exact moment I needed help, or he wasn't really a cop at all. It's been a decade, and I still think about this encounter. Without that man, I wouldn't have been able to get back on the highway unless I took a risk or sat there in confusion and shock with the possibility of someone hitting me while snow, ice, and sleet fell on my car. It was a very peculiar and life-saving encounter I won't ever forget. Case Fall Number 1007 Written by Symbiotic Tao Impossible British Music So just now, I was listening to Rural Britannia, as one does, and I turned off my phone, I am certain of this, and went downstairs to get batteries for my Xbox controller and a glass of water. As I neared my room, I heard a sound again. I entered, and I could clearly hear the tune of Rural Britannia still playing, then it stopped. Then I heard a man sing, without music, and Britons will never be slaves, which was odd as this was not the same voice from the song I was listening to, not the same emphasis and not even the same words, there's no and before Britons. Then silence again, confused but assuming the phone must still be on, I picked it up, it was still turned off, just as I was certain I'd left it. Nobody else in the house is awake and I have never experienced hallucinations. I haven't a clue what to make of this. Case File Number 1008 Written by Jack Black The Shack of Whispers First Occurrence So the Fey Trail is what my buddy called it. I don't know what that is, but it's what he called it. But anyway, we were going for a hike around a lake we live near, and about an hour and a half in, he stops and looks into the woods. I ask what he's looking at and he just points. I look where he's pointing and there is a pretty damn near perfect gap in the forest, like trees just didn't grow in this 3 or 4 foot line going straight as an arrow into the forest, so I think it's cool as hell and start walking towards it. He tries to chicken out, but I don't let him. We get to where the trail starts and he freaks out, cause there are mushrooms growing down the sides of the trail, like a border for it. I keep walking but he literally yanks me back to the normal trail by my backpack and refuses to talk about it for the rest of the hike. I went back a few days later and couldn't find it. I assumed I had just missed it but he says that it was a fake trail and that it's gone now. I don't know what he's talking about. Second Occurrence The standing tree happened right outside of my house. There was a massive thunderstorm one day before and it had struck a tree about 200 feet from my front door and knocked it over. Not a big deal. I'll get rid of it on the weekend, I thought to myself. The storm stopped for a bit, then continued into the next day. I had to leave for work and I saw the tree down as I opened my door and when I turned to lock it, there was another strike near my house. I spin around to see if another tree fell and the tree that was already down was back up at about 45 degrees, and as I stood there being soaked, it kept going up and just stood up again. I feel like reattached would be a more accurate description. I was already going to be late for work, so I went to work and when I got back home, I checked out the tree. I knew it was the same tree, because it had bits of bark blown off of it. I'm 100% sure it was the same tree. It had cracks all along where it had broken, and there were still branches on the ground from where it fell. After that it just kept growing. In a few months most of its branches were sprouting again and it just acted like it didn't fall over. Those marks are still there although the tree is now dead. Third Occurrence The Whisper Shack is probably the strangest of these stories and I could go on and on about it. I have some foggy memories of it and some really clear ones too. The first time I found it, I was just wandering around in the woods looking for stuff to shoot with my new BB gun. 
I came to a small clearing I hadn't been to before, and there is this little shack that could have been there for God knows how long. It was all sorted out and had definitely seen better days. I figured there might be something inside I could use for targets, so I walked up to it. About 50 feet away from it, I stopped. I don't really know why, but I did, and I had to convince myself to get closer. About 20 feet away, I thought I heard someone say my name. I look around and there's no one there, and I keep walking, and I get to the door and knocked for some reason. From inside, I heard someone say, Who is it? It sounded like they were right behind the door because it was really quiet, no more than a whisper. So I bolt and get the hell out of Dodge, because creepy dude in the forest is not going to be how I died. As I get to the edge of the clearing, I look back and the door is open, not all the way, but kind of like half open, like someone was peeking outside. I didn't go looking for it again, but a few years later, I was walking in the woods doing other kid crap on summer break, but I found the shack again. Not the clearing, but just the shack. It felt like it just appeared there because I didn't notice it at all, and then I'm like 30 feet away from it. I walk up to the door and it's cracked open. I push it all the way open and it damn near falls off its hinges. I go inside and it's empty, except for a table and a chair. There is an old candle on the table that must have been huge from the amount of wax melted onto the table. As soon as I cross the threshold, it feels like someone is breathing down my neck. I spin around and there isn't anyone there. It was probably just wind and nerves. I go in and sit on the stool. It was hot and I was tired. I decided to light the candle because to hell with fire safety. As I'm sitting there, someone whispers in my ear and I get up and shut the door. I don't remember what I heard or why I shut the door, I just did, and then sat back down and watched the candle. It burned amazingly bright, lighting the whole shack with a flame that I remember as being really big. I remember sitting there and hearing some more whispers that I just can't remember what they said, but all my nerves were gone. I was just relaxing in the glow and warmth of the candle. At some point, I remember getting up and sitting back down on the floor, still watching the candle, then watching the shadows on the wall. They seemed so alive, dancing in time with the flame. It seemed like I spent hours there. Eventually, the whispers told me to get up, but I didn't want to. I sat there for a little longer. They said something else and I got up, grabbed my coat, and stepped into a cold fall afternoon. I was halfway home before I realized that it was fall, and when I went, I was sure it was summer. I get home and everything is normal. My father hugged me when he got home, which he never really did. I just kept living a normal life after that. My grades were really good for that trimester. The next time I remember the shack was in 8th grade. I had gotten this book about how to set traps, and I didn't know I needed a license to do it, so I went to set some deadfall traps and the like. I happened up on the same shack again and remembered what happened last time, so I avoided it. And a few days later, I was checking those traps, and they weren't where I put them. I had about 10 to 15 set up, and they were all arranged in a large circle kind of shape. They weren't like that before, so I took them all down, and when I was looking for the last one, it was right next to the shack. I went inside again, and there was still the table on the stool, but there was no wax and an almost new candle, along with another stool. I remember the whispers coming again and my nerves died down. I sat in the same stool I did last time. The whispers wanted me to light the candle again, but I didn't. They kept telling me to, but I literally couldn't light the candle. I had my lighter in my hand, but I couldn't move to light the candle. The whispers stayed that soft and comforting tone, and I wanted to light the candle, but I just couldn't. Then they got angry with me. They whispered, but it was like someone trying to whisper when they're really angry, like my mother scolding me in public or something. I really wanted to light it, but I couldn't do it. I sat down in the corner and cried, like really freaking hard, snot-nosed and just bawling like a child while I was a child, but just uncontrollable sobbing. The whispers were quieter in that corner, but they were still angry at me, and I didn't know why. I must have been in that corner for at least an hour and a half, maybe more. Once or twice I got up and tried to light the candle, but I couldn't. I remember whenever I tried to, they were nicer to me, and when I couldn't, they got angry. I'm tearing up thinking about what they said to me. 
They stopped asking me to light it and started telling me to. Then they berated me, called me names, told me how bad of a kid I was. They told me things I didn't want to know. They told me things about my parents, about my friends, about my teachers. Stuff that I didn't want to hear. Stuff I shouldn't have known. They told me about my parents' divorce, which came later that year. They told me about my grandfather's death, which happened a year or two later. Many other things that I'd rather not remember, much less mention. Eventually, I stopped crying and got up, stumbled out of the door and went home. Probably took me another two hours to get home, stopping to cry more every so many feet. My parents were out for a few days and I didn't go to school. No one asked questions, no one changed. I blamed a lot of things on that day, but most of all, it changed me deeply. I'm a cold person now. I face down so many situations that would have affected me without any expression, without any feeling. I've had bouts of depression, but I pulled myself out of them. I faced down the barrel of weapons held by myself and by others. I lost a lot that day. Emotions are probably the worst. I felt fear very few times since then, happiness even less. I lost a part of me that day. Maybe it was the part that wanted to live. Damn me. Two packs of cigs and almost a quarter bottle of Jack later I got that story out. Sorry if I was rambling. Sorry if I was a little too in-depth. This is the first time I've told the whole story. Case file number 1009, written by Z Storm. The universe is running out of NPCs. This first happened when I moved schools. I realized the people there looked extremely similar. I first realized it when I saw one girl who looked almost identical to the girl in the previous school. Then I made friends with someone who looked like an older version of my previous friend. It doesn't help that my teachers look extremely similar to my family as well. Both my PE teachers remind me of my grandpa and stepdad. Not only that, but my history teacher looks extremely similar to my biological dad and has a similar personality to my dad. It's the same with my Spanish teacher who looks almost identical to my grandma and similar personality. Maybe these are all coincidences, but I just found it weird because there's way more people than I listed that just look like reused models in a game. I really don't know how to explain it. Maybe it's just my mind playing tricks on me? But why does everyone in my life look like reused models from a video game? Case file number 1010, written by Amon Burmad. I saw my twin, but the proof was erased. This is kinda weird, for me at least. It just got me thinking recently. I traveled to attend the forum for a week. It was a stay-in forum with other representatives from my district, and with me is my, let's say, apprentice. It was about a six-hour flight. We landed and went straight to the venue and hotel. After a day on the forum, me and my apprentice went snooping around, more of a get-to-know-the-place type of thing, and I saw a board of members posted on the wall. I saw someone familiar, and it was me. Face, name, including middle initial, body build, smiling in that picture. I've never been to that place, and my apprentice and I found it funny, so we took pictures and sent it to my wife. My wife sent it to my family. We had a good laugh at it. Didn't think much of it then. Later, a week or two had passed. I thought it would be a great icebreaker to talk about it in the office, so I grabbed my phone to show it to my coworkers, and weirdly, all the photos of him I took were gone. I even called my apprentice and he has no recollection of the things that happened. Even my wife and family don't remember a thing. I tried looking for the photo in the cloud but it was gone. I don't know, I just want to share this here. I found it weird because I clearly remember it happening and I had pictures. I'll look for it again if I have another chance to go there. Case file number 1011, written by Meganoki, the washing machine that twists reality. Growing up, my parents always had white washers and dryers. They never got new ones. They're just the basic ones, the top loaders. Sometime, maybe a couple months or maybe a year ago, I came home and my parents had red washing machines. They're side loaders. They looked brand new. I asked my mom when they got these. She looked at me confused and said they've always had these for years. She was very adamant about it and confused that I didn't know that. These have always been there since they bought the house. I told her I remember the white ones, and she kept saying, no, these are the ones we've always had. Well, I dropped it but was confused. 
Like, how did I not remember the washer and dryer I grew up with? Mind you, I moved into that house when I was 10, moved out when I was 19, and I'm almost 25 now. Okay, fast forward to today. I drove to my parents' house, which is about a 3 hour drive. I needed to pick up my birth certificate. So I'm talking with my mom and then I started looking around the house because I like to see what has changed. The last time I was there was when the red washer and dryer thing happened. I went into the laundry room and saw the white washer and dryer that I remember having growing up. I asked my mom what happened to the red washer and dryer. She said, we had this conversation last time. I've never had a red washer and dryer. These are the same ones from when we got the house. I'm so confused. Bonus file, written by Drinking Vanilla, my phantom beagle. My house has two floors and one set of stairs, only one way up and down. I have one dog, a beagle, and she's not even a year old. I walk into the living room upstairs to grab my wallet and I see her on the couch next to my son's car seat. I lean forward to see if she's chewing on the little toy that hangs from the handle. She's not. I head downstairs to where my bedroom is. I go down and walk over to my bed, and there is my dog, again, laying in my spot looking at me. I physically got chills all over my body and froze. I had just seen her not 45 seconds earlier on the couch upstairs. There's no way she got down before I did, because there's only one way down which I took. I run through it over and over in my head, trying to think of what just happened, and I simply do not know. I'm positive I didn't imagine it. I even checked to make sure the reason she was next to the car seat was not to chew on his toys. Case file number 1012, written by Makisei Kurisu 23, The Devil's Footprints. About 15 years ago, I traveled to Spain with my best friend. We were both around 20 at the time, living the carefree young adult life. You know, just two guys having a great time. We were in a warm country, no carefully filled itinerary whatsoever, just living in the moment, doing whatever we felt like. My friend, who originally came from Spain, still had family there, which made the month-long trip very affordable since they offered us free accommodation, a roof over our head, a working bathroom with fresh showers and three meals a day if we liked. They also gave us a spare key, so we could come and go just as we liked. During the day, we often went swimming to keep us as cool as possible, and during the evenings, we often explored the city, went for drinks, or went to a club. On a certain day, somewhat more to the end of the month-long stay there, the father of our host family, my friend's uncle, took us out for a fishing trip. We had a lot of fun out on the sea, although the trip was cut short because we had a bit too much fun consuming beers. The burning summer sun, too many beers and the wavy feeling of being out on the open sea made for a very bad case of seasickness for both my friend and me. His uncle thought it was funny though. After having an afternoon rest, or as they called it, siesta, and a very fulfilling late night dinner, we decided to go back out to the beach. We took a couple of cold beers with us, however we didn't take that many as we were still feeling a bit groggy from before. It was a beautiful night, open sky, no clouds, little to no light pollution, making the twinkling stars very visible and present. Being on vacation, being young, on a still warm but comfortable summer night with a light breeze and a starry sky, it was the perfect moment to talk about the meaning of life, about what we like to achieve one day, about what was worth it or what wasn't. If there were any other intelligent life out there, or if we would live for another thousand years or not. The crashing of the waves against the sand of the beach and the rocks was very calming and was pulling us into a meditative state. Only that moment and that place seemed to exist. There was no outside world, no life with responsibilities, no obligations, no expectations, no working hard to get somewhere. It was at that moment we noticed something was off. The crashing of the sea against the sand of the beach sounded different? Harder? Like something was moving in it. Under the waves, a vague shape started to form. As it neared the shoreline, it started to get the shape of a dog. We both looked at each other and noticed we had been holding our breaths for about a minute. It took the dog to crawl from the sea to the shoreline. The tension broke because we both burst out laughing 
because we had been so easily startled by something so innocent. But then, my friend asked a question that made the newly regained light mood go away in an instant. Where did that dog come from, though? There's no one around, and we never saw any dog go into the sea. Neither was there any dog swimming around, it came from under the water. Now that he had worded it like that, it seemed rather curious. And actually, that dog seemed pretty big for any existing dog I had ever seen as it was crawling along the beach, solely illuminated by the first quarter moon. It looked like the size of a small horse, but in the shape of a dog or a wolf with matted fur. It had very present, bony joints in its knees and elbows, and walked a bit awkwardly. My friend and I were debating if we should follow the beast and decided we did actually want to find out exactly what it was. I took out my phone and started to film it, as far as any 2008 smartphone could film in the dark. By the time we reached the place at the beach where it had left the water, it had already reached the sand dunes and disappeared in it. We saw it had left a track and decided to follow that into the dunes. We weren't prepared for what we saw next though. The beast had left a track in the sand in the form of individual hoof prints in a straight line instead of a crisscross pattern as with any four-legged animal. No horse could have walked such a line and even though it looked like the size of a horse, it hadn't looked anything like the shape of a horse. Neither were horses aquatic animals. We followed the track to the dunes and went over the first dune when we saw the beast standing about 10 meters from us in a speck of moonlight. It didn't look anything like a dog either. It looked like it had the lower half of a goat and the upper half of something like a werewolf or something. Just the dimensions were off, the shapes were awkward. It was such a big animal, neither of us could place it under any existing animal we knew of with matted fur and bony joints that had just come out of nowhere from under the water. Clearly could walk and survive on the land as well, that left hoof marks in a straight line, because we had just stumbled through the bushes closely behind the beast and had given away our presence. It slowly started to turn its head towards us. While it was turning towards us, it stood on its hind legs. Not only was this an animal that came from under the water, as well as could survive on the land and walk on four legs, it could clearly stand and walk very well on two legs as well. The beast gained even more size by standing on its hind legs and must have been around 2.5 meters big. It stared at us with red, glowing eyes. These were not to be mistaken with the eyes of any nocturnal animal with reflective eyes, these were actually glowing from within. I felt stuck in my spot, completely frozen, but luckily my friend, who was two steps behind me, had the mind to run away and pull me with him. We ran for what felt like an hour, but must have been closer to ten minutes because we reached the house of my friend's family before we knew it. The beast hadn't followed us, or at least not all the way. We went in and told the entire story to his uncle. Of course he thought we must still have been drunk and tired and seen things that weren't there, but when we showed him the recording, he went pale. He took a shovel, a gun would have been more impressive against a beast like that, but it's not like the average European just has guns lying around, and asked us to show us where we had seen it. We searched for almost two hours, but didn't find the beast again. However, we did find hoof marks, albeit a bit washed up because of the current of the sea. We went back home, trying to make something of what we had just seen, but couldn't, we needed to know what animal we had just seen. We started googling all kinds of things. Of course, with the lower half of the beast looking like a goat, we stumbled upon a lot of myths about the devil, which we discarded. We had seen an actual live beast that wasn't known by any humanity yet and wanted to know if any other people had seen anything like it. It was only when we googled hoof marks one straight line that we stumbled upon the term the devil's footprints. So it was an actual thing, or at least something that had supposedly been seen before according to myths and stories. But they must have some truth to them since they described exactly what we had just seen with our own eyes. The few days we had left in Spain, we spent our nights out with my friend's uncle trying to find the beast again, but to no purpose as we never saw it again. When I came home a few days later, I saved the recording to my hard drive, not sure what to do with it yet. I didn't want to be the crazy guy that had seen the devil because I still don't believe I did. 
I just want to know what animal this was and how come we haven't documented this beast yet. I tried to forget about it, but couldn't, and a year later I decided I wanted to publish the recording in the hope anyone could make any sense of what we had seen that night. The uncle of my friend hadn't seen the beast in all that time and had asked around in the town if anyone had seen it, which they didn't. I had switched phones by then, but luckily I had the recording saved on my desktop where I had replayed it at least a thousand times. I booted up my desktop and something was wrong. I had to restart the desktop a couple times and after booting up in safe mode, I got the message my hard drive had scratched. I tried whatever was possible to try, but I couldn't recover the recording in any way. Fifteen years later, I'm still breaking my head over what the beast we encountered could have been, but by now, it's a story my friends believe to be for making conversation. Only that friend and his uncle are still branded by the experience as well. My friend even took it so far as to go live in Spain again, near the beach where it all happened, and still continues to actively look for the beast to this day. Maybe one day he'll find it? This is a shout out to Martino Silva and their brother, who have insomnia and trouble sleeping in general, and apparently my videos help them to fall asleep, which is just awesome. I do love hearing that. I hope you guys get good rest. Case file number 10,013, written by Sim Mini. I am the immortal driver. This happened 24 years ago, in the year 1999. I completely forgot about this incident until I read a Reddit post very similar to my own experience and it jogged my memory. I was home from college for the summer, visiting my family. One day, I asked my mom to borrow her car so I can go visit my friends who stayed at the dorm during summer vacation. She said I can have it, but I need to be home before 10am the next morning because she needs a car the next day. My college was about an hour's drive from my house on a good day. Some friends of mine would take it in 45 minutes. The fastest driving time I had heard of was 35 minutes. Late at night, no traffic, driving like the wind. I got to my friend's house, our dorm residence, in the early evening and we decided to drive down to the nearby casino, about a 30 minutes drive, to pass the night. We were a group of about 5, 2 of my roommates, 2 other friends from our dorm and I. We had a great time playing on the quarter slot machines. Once we were all tired and were ready to leave, we headed to the lobby doors and realized it's early morning, around 5am, and it's pouring rain. It was raining so hard, we could barely see the first row of parked cars just in front of the lobby. We waited for about 30 minutes or so for the rain to slow to a drizzle, so we could drive home and make the 30 minute drive without incident. When we got to the dorm, it was around 6am and the rain was pouring down again, so I resolved to wait it out as long as I could. I still had to return the car to my mom and had at least an hour's drive if not longer due to the weather. When I left the dorm it was around 7am. One of my roommates stayed up with me until I left and we both noted the time as I was leaving. I got to my car a few minutes later and started driving towards the highway. I was really tired since we basically pulled an all nighter at the casino, but I had to drive home to return the car to my mom. I do not recommend driving tired. I told myself I'll be fine. I cranked up the radio to my favorite station, lit a cigarette, opened the window for some fresh air and so off I went. Again, please do not drive while tired. Within 10 minutes or so, as I'm driving on the highway, the rain starts pouring again. It was so bad I could barely see the wipers of my car. They were at the fastest setting and it's like they weren't doing anything. But the rain was kind of hypnotizing. The rhythm sort of started lulling me to sleep, but I didn't really notice. My blinks kept getting slower and slower. What happened next was in a span of about 3 to 5 seconds, not more. It's kind of hard to explain. I was awake one moment, sort of, and the next my consciousness woke up to darkness. Kind of like when you wake up in the morning but you haven't opened your eyes yet and you are slowly starting to be aware of your surroundings, how comfortable and warm you are in your bed, etc. That's basically what happened. I am aware of being awake but it's dark, I don't even notice my eyes are closed. I'm comfortable but I seem to be in a sitting position. My hands are holding on to something but I'm not sure what it is exactly. I'm just really comfortable and I don't want it to change. 
I kept thinking, just five more minutes. I don't know for how long my eyes were actually closed. Suddenly, I hear a really, really loud crash, almost sounding like a clap, but unlike anything I ever heard before. It sounded like metal on metal, but I wasn't sure. It got me to open my eyes, and the first thing I notice is that I'm in my car, and all I see from the window is a wave of water heading towards my windshield really fast. When it hit the windshield of the car, it sounded like the glass should have broken from the impact. It was the loudest slap sound I ever heard, before or since. I'm in momentary shock as I take in my surroundings. I'm still in my car, driving perfectly straight in the leftmost lane. On my left is a concrete barrier just a couple feet away. On my right, I was just overtaken by a huge 18-wheeler truck. That is what made the wave slap my windshield. Heart pounding, I rubbed my eyes and forced them open as far as they would go. Determined to stay awake, I turned the music louder and opened the window to let the rain hit me in the face, along with some much-needed fresh air. The entire time I was thinking, holy crap, I could have died. I probably should have died. Then another thought hit me. What the frick was the first loud crash I heard? The time elapsed between the first and second claps was about one second. Me hearing the loud clap, opening my eyes to a wave that crashes to the window with another but different sounding loud clap. But all of this wasn't the craziest part yet. Since the rain was very strong, I wasn't driving more than 50 to 60 kilometers an hour as opposed to the usual 100 kilometers an hour. This means that the trip should have taken twice as long as it normally would have. I figured I would be home by 9am at the latest. The rest of the drive was uneventful and I made it to my building, drove into the very large garage and all the way in the back to my parents parking spot. Then I walked back to the elevators by the entrance and took the elevator to the 19th floor. Walked down a long hallway to my apartment, went into my room and crashed on the bed. Right before I passed out from fatigue and probably shock, I remembered to send my roommate a text message to let her know I made it home safely. I was so tired I'd even check what the time was, I just crashed. I woke up to a bunch of messages from my roommate. I don't remember them verbatim, but they were something like, What? No way! You must be joking! Where are you? Hello? How did you get home so fast? No way you're already home. Are you okay? It takes me a while to figure out what she's talking about, while remembering my harrowing journey from the morning, because it was then that I noticed the time of the text that I had sent her before I went to sleep. It was showing at 7.20am. There is no way that it's possible to travel around 90 kilometers in a span of 20 minutes in a rainstorm, where you can't even see the lanes of the road or even the hood of your car while trying desperately not to fall asleep and apparently failing at that. I don't know what to make of this. After reading a whole bunch of other glitch stories, I'm pretty sure it may have been a case of quantum immortality. However, ever since that day, I have been experiencing all kinds of paranormal phenomena throughout the years. I'm pretty sure this was the catalyst event to them all. Well, except for one. This memory is now so clear as if it happened yesterday. I will never forget it. Case file number 10,014, written by Hannah B. Art. My boyfriend mysteriously vanished, then reappeared? About three years ago, my partner and I lived in a top floor flat, fifth floor, no elevator, stairs only, only flat on the floor. It was okay sized, but small enough that you could hear anything going on from any room really. They were all very close together. There was one corridor connecting all the rooms, so you'd cross each other if you were changing rooms. I was working a late shift, and got in around 11.30ish, maybe midnight. Boyfriend was obviously already in bed, so I came in and went straight to the bathroom to wash up, get changed and wind down, etc. Pottered in the kitchen for maybe 10 minutes and had a drink, then headed into the bedroom for the night. I get in, and I can't see my boyfriend. Presume he's just rolled up in the duvet or something, so I go over and move the duvet, and he's literally not in bed. I move the whole duvet back, he's not there. I turn the light on, check the whole room, top to bottom. Thought he might be pranking me, waiting to jump out or something. Nope, not there. 
First thought is, okay, maybe he's in the spare room on his computer having a late night. Nope. In the bathroom and we just missed each other's pass somehow? Nope. I checked the whole flat, top to bottom, every room, door still locked. He is genuinely nowhere. I would hear him if he was sleepwalking or something. Getting panicked, I text him. This is important. Where are you? Maybe for some crazy reason, he's gone out for a walk or something. No response after a few minutes, so I decided to check around one last time. I go into the bedroom. He's in bed. The light's off. He's snoring as if he's been out for hours. I wake him up and explain everything that just happened. He groggily suggests I was dreaming, but he checks his phone and the text is there, plain as day. It definitely happened. He's convinced to this day he was asleep the whole time. The whole thing is bizarre to me. He definitely wasn't there. Where the fuck did he go? He's absolutely certain he was asleep in bed the whole time. But the text proves I wasn't dreaming and I know he wasn't there. Why would I panic and text otherwise? To this day, I have no idea what the fuck happened and I don't think I ever will. People I tell this story to are also just as perplexed. I don't think they believe me. Case file number 10,015. Written by Booty Connoisseur. The teriyaki sauce bottle that changed sizes. I made some food earlier today and went to the fridge to grab some teriyaki sauce. I have always kept my teriyaki sauce in the same place, by the way, along with all the other things I put in the fridge door. I keep it in the top right shelf with sriracha, sour cream, and parmesan cheese. They always go to the same place. Anyways, I pulled out the teriyaki sauce, put some on my food, but when I went to put it back, it won't fit into the spot it was in anymore. I just thought that maybe it was a tight squeeze, but it literally won't fit anymore. I tried for around 20 minutes trying different arrangements and trying to find the way that all the things in that shelf could have fit together, but it won't work. Super confused. After I had thought about it more, I remembered pulling out the teriyaki sauce very easily as well, and I always have been able to pull it off super easily out of the shelf. I don't know how in the world all of those things fit into that compartment. First time I've ever come across something like this. Before you ask, nothing could have fallen or moved in that compartment in the 5 to 10 seconds that I used the teriyaki sauce. I even kept the fridge door open when I put it on. Like I said, I've always kept the same things in that fridge compartment. The size of the bottle did not change after I used it, and none of the sizes of anything in that compartment should have changed. Case file number 10,016. Written by Gundam's 93CM Titties. The Time Destroying Bathroom. Today, me and my friends went to Carl's Jr. after school for some food. Me and my friends are 16 to 17, by the way. This isn't a childhood story, technically. And I needed to pee. So after we all ordered, I went to the bathroom and did my business. And when I first walked into the small bathroom with two stalls, a lady who was washing her hands complimented my shoes. I said thanks and she left the bathroom after that. When I exited the bathroom and walked over to where my friend sat, I mentioned the lady and the compliment she gave me. I was wearing some wacky shoes so it was notable. They all proceeded to say that no one left the bathrooms, which makes sense as there was no one else in the restaurant at the time and this lady had a pink shirt on and was not an employee. One of my friends gets up and goes to the bathroom to check for the woman but to no avail. They did say that they experienced some oddities, like the music and smell being off. Then I get up to investigate for myself and walk into the bathroom again and look around. I couldn't have spent more than a minute there and I didn't notice anything amiss. I walk over to my friends and they ask what took me so long. Apparently I was gone for 10 minutes. I get confused and say that I only spent a minute in the bathroom looking for that woman and all my friends proceed to get more confused and tell me that I didn't tell them about a woman of any sort. At first I thought they were joking. I told them to quit it and give it to me straight. They then gave evidence for me spending 10 minutes in the bathroom and they kept to their story. Even many hours later now, they haven't caved, which is a very impressive bit or they are being truthful. I believe the latter because my friends know very well that I got distressed over this and one of my friends started doing their own research into what was happening too. None of my friends are good at lying too. They have huge tells and crack after little effort. Needless to say, the entire situation was odd and I'm not entirely sure what happened. The lady disappeared, my friends acted entirely differently, and I lost time. 
Case file number 10017, written by Kiss Me Goodbye. The light bulb exploded, and then it was brand new. This happened like an hour ago, and I'm still pretty shaken. I went to turn on the light in my bedroom so I could do some cleaning, and the light switch shocked me and made a crackling noise. The lights went on for a second, then there was a sound of glass breaking and the light was off, by itself. Obviously, my first instinct was to get all the glass shards off myself and get out of the room. I bandaged a few spots where the shards had cut me and went back to the room to inspect the damage. The light is working fine now, and I started to clean up, but when I checked the ceiling, every light bulb in the room was intact. I even felt for cracks and all of them are pristine. I know I didn't hallucinate it because I just spent 45 minutes cleaning glass shards off of everything, but I have no idea where they came from or what the hell happened. Creepy file number 83, written by Far Cry Fan 15, Secrets of the Deep Appalachian Mountains. Okay, so first off, these stories are 100% true. Most were told by family and friends through the years, along with some of my own encounters in the rural mountains and ridgelines of my county. Of course, as with all creepy stories, to give you a good scare, take them with a grain of salt. However, I must still say that these stories are as real as me sitting here writing this up. I hope you all find these as interesting as I do. Background I have grown up in eastern Kentucky for several years since the age of one. My family, both sides, have grown up in the rural Appalachian their whole lives as well. But as with modern times, moved to this small town nestled here in a valley situated in between rolling hills and deep ridgelines. Where the following stories take place is a rural area nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains. It's got a name and it's considered a county, however the area where my dad's family grew up in within this area, and where these stories come from, is more like a collection of deep ridges and mountain folks than anything else, just to clear up any confusion that this is an actual town. During the early days of the settlers, these mountains were home to the Cherokee Indians, Many cemeteries in this area actually have around 30 to 40 graves of Native Americans buried there, marked with stones and rocks rather than a more traditional Indian burial routine. In the 1800s, George Washington's aide-de-camp, Colonel Grayson, was bestowed upon him a 70,000-acre piece of land, which is now where my town is located today. Story number one. In the 1970s or 80s, my mom and her aunt along with her small cousins were driving on an empty road just outside of town when they crested the top of a hill where an abandoned farmhouse stood. They stopped the car in its tracks when they saw a massive hovering saucer-shaped craft hovering over the house. Frightened, my mother and her aunt booked it out of there at a high rate of speed. Scared, they continued down the mountain back to town quickly. However, when they looked in the rearview mirror, they saw the craft coming after them fast, tailing the car and keeping up with them. They attempted multiple times to evade the craft, but to no avail. It chased them for over a mile back to town until finally, just at the edge of the county road that leads back into town, it finally disappeared. My mother has told the story at least a hundred times to family and friends, most of whom believe her, as they too have seen strange lights in the sky in and around the various areas of the community, though some don't. She drew me a picture of the spacecraft a few years ago, which I still have. It's grey and almost metallic looking. By the way, she drew it as having red lights on all edges of the bottom of the craft along with a few green lights on the sides of it. Story number 2 When my mother was a child, old enough to know when something was going on, she was at home with her parents and siblings one night, and a man whom her mother and family already knew and were acquainted with barged into the house terrified out of his wits. He lived in a cabin deep within the woods some miles away. During his stay there, he reported poltergeist activity, orbs, and other bizarre activity within the property and the house itself. He would go on to tell my grandmother that reportedly he was tormented all night by a demon who threw pots and pans, glasses, and even furniture at him. This went on for almost the entire night. It would throw them completely out of the cabinets, almost hitting him with it. It also reportedly started knocking and tapping on the sides of the house and thumping the walls and ceiling. Finally, he mustered up the nerves to utter the Lord's Prayer and attempt to rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. 
This seemed to piss him off even more and cause it to become even more aggressive and now would try to kill him with heavier objects. He ran from the house and spent around 7 to 8 hours walking through the woods and rural county roads back to my grandmother's house. While on his way to the house, he reported that he could hear footsteps trailing him in the woods and next to the road, but he couldn't see anything. He continued this for several hours until he finally reached their house. Story number 3 In the 90s in town sat a white brick house at the top of a small hill, where a man and his wife lived for several years. The man was in his 40s or 50s, and the woman somewhere around the same age, I believe. Anyways, one day, while my mother was working at a local gas station where the woman also coincidentally worked at, the man had called her saying that something was wrong with the gas in the house and he was going to look at it to see if he could fix it. The gas was located in the basement. He went downstairs and laid on his back and crawled up under the thing to see what happened. He lit a match and immediately the house exploded, sending rubble everywhere and a massive fireball and smoke that could be seen throughout town. The man's wife, who saw the explosion from the gas station, ran home to discover the house gone and nothing left but its foundations. The man's body, as one might expect in a situation like this, was blown into pieces with body parts even littering some neighboring houses. Since then, it has become a local legend that the man's spirit haunts the house that was built on the land where the original one stood. The show Ghost Hunters, or maybe another ghost hunting TV series, actually filmed an episode here because of the experiences by the home's inhabitants. Everything from pots and pans rattling and stuff being thrown around to actual manifestations inside the residence. Case File Number 10018 Written by Raro Danny R the world's coziest glitch. Alright, so about a year ago, I bought my favorite sweater. I've been consistently wearing this sweater and I'm obsessed with it. Polyester material, shiny, athletic, etc. So about two to three months ago, it suddenly disappeared. We do not live in a huge house, so stuff doesn't just disappear. I tried searching for it in my gym, school, etc. Suddenly, today, during laundry, I found it like nothing, right on top of the laundry. I told my wife, she said I probably accidentally found it while cleaning. I cleaned our room yesterday. Note, we always clean, so stuff doesn't go missing since our house is generally clean anyway. I don't take this as just brushing it off. How has my favorite sweater missing for three months with recognizable design, material, and look suddenly end up in the top of my laundry? I'm not just going to brush this one off. Case file number 10019, written by MuchBite9284. My dog is an imposter? My dog was whining to go outside. Mind you, it's about 3.30 in the morning, so I let him out into my fenced yard and stand at the door so he can do his business. He goes to the side of the house normally, so I don't think much of it. But after a minute, I call for him because it's cold and I want to sleep. The way my fence is set up is it runs the length of the house but stops at the back and has a gate to go from the front slash side yard to the backyard. The gate stays closed with a padlock and is about 8 foot tall. The reason I'm worried is because I clearly saw my dog go to the right side of my house when I let him out and when I called him, he immediately popped out from the left side. There's absolutely no way I would not have seen him cross in front of me since I was kind of hurrying him. Also, when he was whining to go out, he was jumping around and happy, but after he came back, he stopped in front of my steps and sat down and just stared at me. This is very unusual for him. I had to go out and basically coax him into the house where he sat and stared at me from across the room until I put him in his room. Am I crazy or did I just let something in my house that's not my dog? Did things just glitch and he happened to just be on the other side after? He's been acting weird since he's come inside. My dog is going back and forth between the two doors to my bedroom and sniffing around them. This isn't his normal behavior since he knows he's not allowed in my room. My dog and I had a conversation and I think we agreed that if he's a skinwalker that he'll switch out with my real dog once in a while. Oh, and he won't kill me. Bonus file, written by Embarrassed Medium 153 My boyfriend's phone was stolen by Casper? About a month ago, 
My boyfriend and I were on the couch at our home watching a scary movie around 9 p.m. He has two phones, his personal cell and his work phone. Once we finished the movie, I said I was going to get the shower going and wait for him to join me after he called his daughter to tell her goodnight. He used his personal phone to call her, leaving his work phone on the couch alongside his personal one once he hung up. He came to check on me in the shower and told me he would be in after he grabbed some clothes and a towel. However, after going back to the bedroom to grab those, he noticed that his personal phone was missing from the couch. He was only gone for about a minute from the living room to the bathroom. He spent another 5 minutes looking for it everywhere in the house, even tried calling it from his work phone several times before giving up and getting into the shower with me. About 30 minutes pass. He tells me about the incident and we think nothing of it since I promised to help him find it after we got out. However, once we got out, we spent another 5 minutes tearing the house apart, still nothing. He and I both called his personal phone several times, but we couldn't hear it anywhere. I finally have the idea to try and ping it using the shared location services, that's when it shows up, claiming to be in the neighbor's front yard? He thought I was joking with him, until I showed him my screen. Neither of us had left the house, both the front door and the back door still remained locked from when we got home earlier that day. I thought he was actually the one pranking me, he promised he wasn't. I stood in the doorway as he got a jacket on and went outside with his work phone, using it as a flashlight and to call his personal phone. He looked for it for a while, but then I watched as he bent down, dug in our neighbor's bushes and retrieved his flashing personal phone that lit up due to the incoming call. It had been raining and was very muddy, yet his phone was completely dry and seemingly untouched when he retrieved it. As he called it, the phone didn't make any sounds, just buzzed. Yet when he double checked that he kept the ringer on, thinking it got turned off, it was on, as it should have been playing his ringtone, but it never did that the entire time we looked for it. To this day we cannot explain how it never rang even with the ringer on was still dry after sitting in the rain and mud for about 40 minutes total and how it ended up buried in the neighbor's bushes. Ever since this incident with the phone, more strange things have happened. Things have been knocked over in the middle of the night, I hear footsteps when I'm home alone, see things out of the corner of my eyes, and the scariest one yet, we have light fixtures that you click on and off like flat buttons, not the switches. He and I were sitting on the couch in the living room when all of a sudden the lights in the dining room began to turn on and off. The creepy part was that the buttons were being clicked rapidly and loudly too. I would have chalked it up to faulty wiring if it was just the lights going crazy but the buttons were physically being pressed and making noise too, as if someone was pressing it on and off very quickly. He said he has never experienced anything like this in this house before, it started happening after I moved in. After reading some comments, I'm beginning to think it's some sort of entity. It might be attached to me. I've had other mysterious experiences before, too. Case file number 10,020, written by Blank Books. The multiverse is losing track of our things. I've been an enthusiast follower of Glitch in the Matrix stories for a while, as simulation theories and such are extremely fascinating. I never thought I would experience something, though. Disclaimer. I was not under the influence of any substances when any of this took place. I live alone and have alarms in my home. I smoke plant mass regularly, 3-4 to four times a week, and clean my grinder every month. I'm medically diagnosed with OCD and know where everything is at all times. I was cleaning my grinder last night and I have two small white trays to scoop it with. I dropped one in my kitchen on dark grey tile and couldn't find it despite the color and how small my kitchen is. I looked and looked and looked as it seemingly vanished. After not finding it, I proceeded to clean the rest of my stuff. This morning, it was on the opposite side of my counter where I keep a lighter, my grinder and the Keefe scooper things in a drawer. It was just sitting on the counter that I had looked at and walked past after losing it last night several times. This probably seems small, but I'm literally shaking as I type this. There is no logical way it could have ended up there. Something finally happened to me and I don't know how to feel. All doors locked, I live alone in a single level home and my sister and girlfriend have a key to my home but both are out of town. Ring cameras and Arlo cameras inside didn't catch anything. 
Case file number 10021, written by Bigger on the Inside, 42. The never-ending supply of mac and cheese. This is ridiculous, but I have no explanation. A while back, I bought a set of vintage craft mac and cheese promo watches from a yard sale. One was triangle-shaped and one was rectangle. This is important. I recently sold those watches on my Etsy store. I remember grabbing them out of the drawer and we shipped them off, no problem. Not long after, I got a message from the buyer saying they got the watches, but that they got two triangle watches and really wanted the rectangle one. He even sent a photo as proof. I checked the listing and the photo shows one triangle and one rectangle watch. So how did the buyer get two triangle watches? I go back and check the drawer and sure enough, there is a rectangle watch in there. But there were only ever two watches to begin with, not three. I asked my store partner if he remembered more than two watches and he didn't. He clearly remembers me buying two watches. Okay, weird, but whatever. I shipped the rectangle watch to the buyer and all as well. Until today. My partner was filling orders this morning and found another rectangle watch in the drawer. So essentially, we ended up with two sets of watches, two triangles and two rectangles. But the listing only showed a quantity of one set and we both only remember buying one set. Do I just have a never-ending supply of vintage Kraft Mac and Cheese promo watches now? Bonus file, written by Sanibel98. My 200-year-old church is haunted. The church campus consists of the sanctuary, the office, an empty, decrepit house where the priests used to live that was later used as a meeting space until it was condemned, and a cemetery with the oldest graves being those of War of 1812 soldiers. All the buildings have stone exteriors. A priest died in the house in the late 1800s. He was old, so nothing nefarious there. But he still haunts the place, which seems odd to me since he was a priest and obviously believed in heaven, the afterlife. Why stick around? When I first started working there, I was in the office with a member of the congregation who told me that on several occasions when they left the old house and turned off all the lights, they would turn around and see the lights that had been switched back on inside, through the windows. I believed in the paranormal even then and have had an experience myself, so I was intrigued. When I left the office that day by myself, I turned off the lights. At the last light switch, I felt almost an electric buzz surge through my finger. The office itself is old, so it wouldn't have surprised me if something wasn't grounded right, etc. Didn't think anything unusual about it. I went back to my desk to grab my things and lock the door, and the light switch I had turned off was on. Keep in mind, this was the same day as when I found out about the priest. I've tried asking him again to show me any sign that he's there, but he's never done anything else in the four years I've been working there. But without asking... I've seen flashes of light in a dark, windowless room. I'm not sure if it was pareidolia, but I saw a man cross in front of my headlights and disappear. He had dark hair and was wearing a white shirt. One time, I unlocked the deadbolt on the door to the church, and when I went to turn the knob to go inside, something turned it the opposite way in my hand. This was during lockdown, so definitely no one was inside. I ran. I've seen motion detector lights outside turn on by themselves, and when I've jumped in front of them waving my hands, they've never come on. I've heard this one from my boss who's a priest. The organist was practicing by themselves in the church when a pencil went flying across the room. My boss also told me that members have said they've seen the priest looking out of the windows of the house. The decrepit house is supposed to be torn down within the next year or two. I'm not sure how or if that will affect the priest who won't leave. Maybe he finally will. Case file number 1022, written by Fiona, the pencil that controls the world. I have to say that I'm a person who could see a donkey flying and wouldn't think much of it. I will probably find it weird at first and then go about my day without thinking much of it. It's been a while that I've been listening to Glitch in the Matrix stories, and while thinking about if one has ever happened to me, nothing came up in my head. Until one day, without even thinking about glitches, this weird event from 10 years ago popped into my head. Keep in mind that I found the event very weird when it happened, but then I didn't think a lot about it, so my memory is a little blurry as to what really happened. I come from a small town in a small country. I was studying at a boarding school in the capital at the time, and on the weekends I would travel to my hometown. 
One Friday, before going back to my hometown, I went to a stationery shop with a friend of mine. I needed to buy a pack of refills for mechanical pencils, which are not sold in my small hometown. I remember buying one very well, because I wanted to cut the line out of worry of missing the bus, and my friend stopped me. She asked me if I knew who the man I was about to cut in line in front of was, but I didn't know. Turns out it was a famous folk singer, whom I had definitely heard of, but never knew how he looked since it's not my kind of music. This is irrelevant to the story itself, but it is the reason that I remember very well buying one refiller case for mechanical pencils. Afterwards, I traveled to my hometown, and as soon as I reached home, I realized that my pencil case, which contained all of my stationary stuff, was missing from my bag. I remember having it when I left the bus, and it must have fallen on my way home. To be fair, it was my fault for putting it at the top of an open bag that was full of other stuff, so it's no surprise that it fell. I went with my father to look for it by walking the path we had just followed to get home, but we couldn't find my pencil case. I had lost all my pens and pencils and all the other stationary stuff that was inside of it, so I was upset about it, but I was mostly upset about the new refiller pack that I had just bought earlier. Here's where things make no sense. That same weekend, I ended up finding two brand new mechanical pencil refill cases, identical to the one I had bought in my hometown where they were not even sold. I found one the very next day, 10 steps from my home, and I'm surprised, but somehow I don't question it. I had this conviction that it was the same one that I had bought the day before. It makes no sense why it was there, since I lost the whole pencil case and it would have been inside with the other things. And I'm sure that I didn't lose the pencil case on that spot, since I realized I had lost my pencil case as soon as I got home and that area was within my field of view so I would have immediately noticed if that was the case. It's a little blurry how I ended up with another identical and brand new refiller case because it's been 10 years since the event. But from what I can remember, my father brought me the second refiller that very weekend, but I do not know where he found it. Pretty sure he did not buy it, but found it. I'm considering the second one a gift from the universe, I guess. However, I never recovered the rest of the things that I had lost, but hey, at least I got two new and identical refills, I guess. Bonus File, written by Lonely Ad 9225 Unexpected Inspection, by my dead boss. So this just happened last week. The warehouse I work at is reloading an empty trailer with a pallet jack. Once I filled it up with 30 pallets of merchandise, I decided to have one last look and inspect everything one last time before I closed it and got ready to send it on its way. I walked in and was halfway in when I saw my boss standing there. I froze in fear and I called out to him. I'm like, Alex, when did you come in here? He turned around and he was pale and ignored me, then walked out. This is not like him. Alex never ignores me, but it was as if he didn't know me. I then walked out confused and went to his office. The lights were out. I asked my coworker, why is Alex inside the container I was loading? I told her it's very strange. He was just standing there and even ignored me. She was like, that's impossible. He left on an errand like 20 minutes ago and hasn't come back. I didn't believe her. So I went to the parking lot and his car wasn't there. Once I saw that, I felt dizzy and almost had a heart attack. I still have the image fresh in my mind of what I saw there. I saw him, but like I mentioned, it was more like a scary version of him. He looked pale and just scary and completely ignored me as if he didn't see me. Then afterwards, Alex had just been in a nasty car accident and didn't make it. I am beyond terrified to go back to work. But I have to go. I can't explain what happened. No, I don't do drugs, nothing like that. I know what I saw. I saw his ghost to make sure I finished my job. I just hope he doesn't keep appearing. After that happened, another coworker told me she was in the break room and she felt like someone was behind her and staring at her. She turned around and there was nobody there. Case file number 10,023, written by Kelly. My father is unbound by space-time. My son, eight male, and I, 42 female, were in his bedroom reading a story before bedtime. I had my back to the door and I was just reading a children's bedtime story to my almost asleep son when I heard from behind me my dad's voice calling my name. It startled me as we were home alone. 
I turned around quickly to see my dad just rounding the corner, heading down the stairs. I only saw the back of him, and only for a split second, but I knew it was him. I called out to him, but he didn't answer. I got up and quickly followed him. As I rounded the corner to the stairs, I saw him in a side profile, just turning the corner at the bottom of the stairs into the kitchen. I called out to him again, but still no answer. I was so confused. I headed quickly down the stairs to catch up to him, but as I rounded the corner into the kitchen, in an almost run at this point, he wasn't there. I ran through the kitchen into the living room, but the house was empty, totally quiet. Now I was more than confused. I checked the entire house. I checked the front and back doors, which were both still locked up tight. I called my dad on the phone and he answered straight away, and he was at home, four miles away, and hadn't left all evening. I was fully awake, I hadn't been drinking, and have never taken any mind-altering drugs. I have carbon monoxide alarms in the house, which I test weekly, so it's not that. I have no explanation for this, and I'm struggling to come up with any. Case file number 10,024, written by Shih Tzu 13 Master, the dog with a grand secret. So I have this aging lap dog. I built a ramp for him to use when I opened the door, for him to pee, instead of him having to use the stairs. I would open the door, he'd run down the ramp, do his business in the garden, and then come back and have me lift him back up into the house. He won't take the stairs or go back up the ramp anymore. I just did the routine. He came back, waited to be lifted, I checked his butt in case I needed to clean it. I have him in my bed so skid marks aren't going to happen, huh? <laughs> and then set him down on the floor in the hallway, drawing the door closed behind me. I followed him through the hallway and stepped into the living room. I threw another log in the fire and then turned to look through the open door to confirm that he's on his doggy sofa waiting to be lifted into bed, but he wasn't there. I checked the kitchen, not there, living room, still no. Bedroom? Nope. Went back through the hallway to see if he had somehow ended up in the bathroom. Nope. What the hell? Where is he? In desperation, just to confirm I'm not crazy, I opened the back door again to see if I didn't just imagine the entire sequence. And there he was, happily just returning from his pee. He didn't look worried at all, not at all having the having been left outside look on him. What the hell? I thought teleportation was firmly in the cat domain. Creepy file number 84, written by Holly Hot Dogs, an unearthly South Haven experience. So I'm going to start by saying I'm basically a skeptic when it comes to paranormal, although I love hearing stories and listening to others' points of views when it comes to that kind of stuff. This is why I'm having such a hard time understanding what happened to me last September. My dad, grandma, grandpa, and I were attending my cousin's wedding in a small rural town just outside of South Haven, Michigan late last summer. We rented a small house in town, which was located in a very wooded area just off a small lake. Something felt extremely off as soon as I got out of the car, at our rental property. That's the best way I could describe it. Something felt off, and I was immediately uneasy. But being the skeptic that I am, I shrugged it off and chalked it up to being tired and anxious. The night we arrived, my dad and I were having a smoke outside and noticed how weird everything sounded. It was about 11pm and there was no one else around. The trees were crackling incredibly loudly and we were hearing strange animal noises, but nothing too out of the ordinary. Just the type of animal noises you would hear in rural Michigan, but they just sounded particularly strange for us for some reason. We said our good nights and went to bed. The next morning, my dad told me that he went outside for a smoke at about 2ish that morning and heard what sounded to him like someone close by banging on metal siding. He said it sounded like it was just next door, but didn't hear anything leading up to or preceding the loud banging, like footsteps or anything like that. We shrugged and laughed it off. The second night was when I heard the thing that I still can't stop thinking about six months later. It was about 11pm, maybe midnight and I was having my last smoke of the night. My grandparents were already asleep, and my dad had just gotten into bed, but still awake watching TV. I was sitting on the stairs outside with my back to the house, looking straight out into the backyard. I heard someone shout my name in a very abrupt manner, loud and fast. It sounded like they were shouting towards me, from the front of the house, like they were standing on the front porch shouting for me, knowing I was at the back of the house. 
It sounded just like my dad, but it couldn't be him because I didn't hear the front door open or close or anything. Being a skeptic, I reminded myself to stay calm and I quickly walked back into the house. My dad was sound asleep now. There was no way that by the time I got to him, he could have gotten back into bed and then fallen asleep. I woke him up and asked if he was outside screaming my name. He looked confused and said of course not. I started to get really freaked out at this point. I tried to go to bed but couldn't get that scream out of my head. I was up all night trying to figure out what happened. I was honestly contemplating leaving, getting a hotel room somewhere close by and returning in the morning. Miraculously, I must have fallen asleep sometime around 3am. We woke up the next morning and I was so ready to get the hell out of town. As soon as we left, the uneasy feeling I had the entire weekend disappeared. When I returned to work the next day, I told my coworker the weird experience I had. Her face immediately dropped. She proceeded to inform me that this is quite common in the Appalachian area regarding cryptids and other types of creatures. Apparently, they try to get your attention by mimicking someone close to you, and when you look at them, they kidnap you or something along those lines. But I was in Michigan. I tried to look up information about the town I was in, but didn't find anything remotely interesting. Has anyone else had a similar experience? Especially in Michigan. Case file number 10,025, written by Megan June 03. An entire building vanished without a trace. I'm a bit nervous to share this. I'm shy. Be nice, huh? I'm a mental health nursing student. We have to have multiple appointments from occupational therapists to see if we're fit for the role. My last appointment was on Tuesday. I got the all clear. I've been doing this for a year. I've never had any hallucinations except possibly the bird, which I'll explain later, and I have no history of mental illness. It is also a very observed course, and if my lecturers, classmates, or therapists thought I had any issues whatsoever, I would be assessed and helped as necessary. So whilst I appreciate this may have been a microdream or hallucination, I do not accept or agree with accusations of being delusional per se. It's sad that I have to put a disclaimer, but please just remember that kindness goes a long way nowadays, more than ever. I go to university and I'm on campus three days a week. I do healthcare, so I'm in a specific building 95% of the time. It's very old, built in the 1800s, and gives me the creeps. Today I was in the same room for three and a half hours, two different lectures. I've never been in this room before. I sat in the same seat the entire time, on the far left of the room next to the bare wall. The whole right side of the room had windows looking out over the campus. I got distracted, as one does during a lecture, and looked outside. I saw a tall, white, concrete building. It must have been about 10 stories tall, with absolutely no windows. On top was a large box with wires around it. Although I wasn't creeped out by this, I did think to myself that it was odd how I'd never seen this building on campus as it was fairly close to the building I was in. To the left were two normal looking buildings, both with windows and no giant box on top. After my first lecture finished, the teacher swapped over. We joked with our new teacher about being in a different building for our next semester as ours was cold and creepy. The building we wanted to be in was about a two minute walk away. To that, my lecturer replied, It's only over there, after someone had complained about it being too far away to move to. She pointed out the window in the direction of the odd building I had seen earlier. It was completely gone, and replaced by what looked like an old clock tower. At first I just thought I must have leaned to the left or right earlier when looking out the window, so I checked again, moving all around my seat to try and see where the white building was. It was gone. I immediately felt spooked. The trees that were in front of the building I saw were still there. The two buildings to the left were still there, but no white buildings. I didn't say anything to my friends at the time, but when the lecture ended, I did a double take and actually went over to the window to look. No building. At all. I later told one of my friends, and she joked that I must be seeing things or shifting dimensions. I laughed it off, but I was, and still am, extremely unsettled and I have no idea why I feel so off about it, seeing as it doesn't seem to be like a big deal. I've had an experience in the past with seeing a pigeon disappear whilst flying in open air, but this was before the glitch in the matrix talk was around like it is now. 
so I just put it down to being in my head, imagining things. Does anyone have any ideas? Was it a time slip or a glitch? I definitely don't have hallucinations, and I was looking at the white building for long enough to know that it was there. I've googled my campus to see if there is any building that looks similar near to where I learn, but there's absolutely none. I found the two buildings to the left, and the clock tower though. I know it might not seem believable, but that's what I saw. Any conspiracies to what happened is greatly appreciated. Case file number 10,026, written by Status Blueberry, 3690, an impossible call. This happened December 2021, when I was visiting my parents for Christmas in Paris. I traveled from North Carolina, so there's like a six hour time difference. My parents and I were staying in an old hotel for one night in a town I don't remember the name of. It was very, very small, just two beds and a bathroom. In the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of my name being whispered over and over again. It was my nickname. Think of John from Jonathan, not my real name. And my boyfriend is the one who calls me by it the most often. At the time, I was laying on my side, facing the wall with my back to my parents' bed. I opened my eyes and at first dismissed it to the sound of my parents breathing or a dream I might have come out of, but I kept hearing it, like it never stopped even after I was fully awake. So I jumped up and looked over my shoulder and it stopped. I just saw my parents sleeping and I could hear them breathing, which didn't sound like the whispers I heard. Creeped out, I just laid back down and tried to ignore what just happened. Five seconds later, my phone that's charging on the small desk at the wall adjacent to the beds starts ringing very loudly. And now that I think about it, I always put my ringer on silent. I get a crap ton of notifications and I think that's weird. I didn't hear anything other than this call. But anyways, I see my boyfriend is calling me and I was kind of annoyed because he knows the time difference, but I answered it in case it was an emergency. Long story short, he said he was returning my calls. He received two FaceTime calls from me in one minute prior, but couldn't answer since he was showing his friend something on his phone. After we hung up, I checked my outgoing calls and sure enough, I tried FaceTiming him twice. It still gives me chills and neither my boyfriend nor I have an explanation for it. At the same moment I woke up to hearing my nickname being whispered, my boyfriend was getting FaceTime calls from me. I wonder what he would have seen if he had answered. Case file number 10,027, written by Vegas V. The glitchiest snow day ever. This happened when I was in high school many, many years ago. I was dreaming that my aunt was calling to tell me there was no school due to snow. My dream was interrupted by me being awoken by the phone actually ringing. I leaned over the bed and picked up the phone. It was my aunt who told me she just saw that my school had canceled class for the day due to snow. My aunt calling the house wasn't a usual occurrence in the early morning, and I can't ever recall her calling to tell us there was a snow day before. I got up and realized just how odd the whole thing was, and walked out to the kitchen to tell my mom about what just happened. My mom was unloading the dishwasher and piling pots and pans on the counter so she could take them across the kitchen and put them away. I was leaning against the counter next to where she was neatly stacking everything, telling her what just happened, when suddenly... I instinctively flinched and went to grab all the pots and pans. My mom just looked at me like I was crazy and said, what are you doing? I looked at the pile that was still sitting on the counter and explained I thought they were falling. I continued my story and a few seconds later all the pots and pans on the counter toppled just like I thought they were going to do seconds earlier and then crashed to the floor. Later that day I was watching TV when for some reason I thought my dad was home. He got home at the same time every day, and it was hours before he was supposed to be home. I was in a room where I couldn't see anyone coming up the driveway, and I hadn't heard anything. I just suddenly thought dad was home. I got up, walked over to the door, and opened it to see my dad walking up to the house. He had left early because the snow was getting worse. Nothing else unusual happened the rest of the day, but over the years I've thought of that psychic day often. Maybe I should have played the lottery that day looking back. Case file number 10,028, written by Mars for Rez, playing in the universe's rubble. General characteristics, observation date, 1988, time, not specified, contact information, not specified, writing date, 
March 29th, 2022. Observation. It was in the late afternoon. I was in a house secluded in the heights of St. Joseph. The exact location is not given for anonymity reasons, part of which was under renovation. My husband was a mason and he had several construction sites. When he could, on weekends, he worked on the house to make progress on the work he was able to. There was concrete rubble with sometimes sharp iron rods and pieces of sharp metal in a corner of the courtyard. For now, it's a detail, but it will be important later. Anyway, I was with my four-year-old child and my husband was about to come home from work. I was doing my household chores inside and my child was playing in the large room. Then I heard my husband's car driving on the dirt road to get to us. My son also heard it and, as usual, he ran out shouting, Dad! He went out through the door and went to wait for his father in front of the house on the concrete driveway. It should be noted that that afternoon the weather was cloudy and gray. A few seconds after my son went out to wait for his father outside, it started to rain and so I also ran out to both pick up my laundry and tell my child to come inside. Once in front of my clotheslines and after picking up a few, I looked to my left to see if my son was at the end of the concrete driveway, but he was not. Suddenly, I heard the sound of stones and metal rubbing on my right. I turned my head and I saw my son playing in the rubble. I shouted his name, promising to spank him if he didn't get out immediately, because yes, the rubble was on my right, he was sitting and crouching in it, his back to me, and he was ignoring my shout, which was nevertheless powerful. Once the laundry was picked up in a few seconds, I issued a final ultimatum to my son, but still nothing, still ignoring me. So I quickly went inside to drop off the laundry basket so I could go back out and retrieve my child from this dangerous pile of rubble. But when I got inside, I almost had a heart attack. My husband was there with our child in his arms, having entered through the back door. In total panic, I still hurriedly dropped off the laundry basket and went back out to see who was in the rubble, and once outside, no one was there. I went back inside and asked my husband where he had taken our child. Of course, this question was absurd because he couldn't have taken the child into the rubble, gone around the house and come back in through the back door in such a short time. I would have seen him anyway. But my Cartesian mind couldn't believe otherwise, so I insisted on him answering that question. But his answer was striking. He told me he had picked up our child at the end of the driveway, they had gone into the car together, and he had driven slowly to the back of the house to take a short ride with his son because he loved it. It was true that I had forgotten that it was our son's habit that every time his father came home, he asked him to take a ride in the car. So when I went out to pick up my laundry and didn't see him at the end of the concrete driveway, it meant that he was already in the car with his father, slowly driving to the backyard. But that's when I saw a child in the rubble who vanished in 5 to 10 seconds, the time it took to put down the basket. Now a few important points to clarify. It couldn't have been a neighbor's child. The closest neighbor was a kilometer away because in 1988 we lived on several hectares of agricultural land. There were very few houses then, unlike now, where house constructions are common. Also, the child I saw looked like my son in every way, but in the rubble he was wearing a red t-shirt, whereas in fact all day that day he was wearing a yellow t-shirt, but at the time I didn't realize it. With the stress of seeing what I thought was my child in dangerous rubble and rushing to pick up my laundry in the rain, Everything happened in almost two minutes. Was it a ghost? I don't know. All I can tell you is that it looked real, as real as you and me. Case file number 1029, written by Trunian, the most ominous ball in the universe. I've always lived alone, dating in bursts, but mostly just going to work. Bought my house in 2008, a cul-de-sac on the hill where we never really get visitors. A visitor has to pass a gate and ascend a 100-foot path to reach the front door. House has a full-size basement, reachable by interior only. I only go down there two times a week for laundry. Polished concrete floor, foundation as walls, no ductwork, all sealed. Spartan, no furniture, no clutter, everything in marked bins and cabinets. Also, I never babysat kids or bought toys. No family, no pets are made, no drugs. Only really have three close friends, similar recluse types. Neither they nor I like pranks. In January 2018, I descended the stairs to do laundry, flipped the lights on, 
and saw a red object in the middle of the floor. It was a rubber bouncy ball, like you'd find at a playground. I checked the windows, valuables, etc., and everything was intact. I took the ball and showed it to people at work to be sure I wasn't crazy. I checked the polished concrete and it was convex to flat, so it's unlikely the ball just rolled there. It felt placed. I don't like having it. A month later, I stopped at a city park and said, thank you, and then threw it downhill to the woods. Case file number 1030, written by Sugar Free Monster. Welcome to the multiverse. We got fun and games. So yesterday, after band practice, I was driving to get my mom from work at night at around 9pm, when I was driving through a really dark and cramped back alley. Everything was going smooth, I wasn't drunk, high, I'm not mentally ill in any way, I swear. All of a sudden, I literally heard a large crash sound and a super unmistakable beam of light, like if I had been t-boned. But I wasn't. Everything automatically went to normal. I was on the road again and all. No cars around. When I got home from picking up my mom, I checked my car for scratches or marks or bumps and it was perfectly fine. The crazy part that brought me to consider the Matrix theory is, this morning, I asked my guitar player to send me the recording of our practice. I listened to them in complete silence with him yesterday, many, many times. I knew exactly what happened where and all. There was a chunk of the practice absolutely missing. I said, hey, where's the other half of the recording? And he said, what do you mean? You had to leave practice early yesterday to get your mom from work. I almost got nauseous. That's impossible. I left late. I was tight on time. Did I hop into a reality where I left earlier to get my mom, ultimately avoiding the car crash? Did, did I die? Creepy file number 85, written by Creative Willingness 7, Black Eyes of Horror. I've had a few creepy things happen to me in my life, but this one, I still think about how things could have gone really wrong very fast. I'm a 20 year old female. This takes place back when I used to live in southern Indiana, like seriously in the sticks. It was a weekend night, and my best friend and I were coming home after our graveyard shift at a local waffle joint. She decided to get her dog from her house so we could stay at my place for the night. That's important for later. So we start heading out into the country where I live, and to get to my house, there's a long, narrow dirt road you have to go down. About a mile in or so, we see a truck's headlights. We get closer and it's a nice truck, probably like a 2018 at least. I can't say I know much about cars, leave me alone. He's parked to where he's sideways, blocking the whole path. Confused, I get out and ask if he's okay. He looked hopeful when he saw me at first. I'm just waiting on a friend to come get me, my truck is stuck. He smiled at me, and I noticed his pupils were nearly completely dilated. He looks back to my car and sees that I have someone with me, and he looks at the dog sticking his head out of the window. His smile fades. He says, Pit bulls are mean and nasty. He quickly turns around and gets back in his truck. I go back to my friend and I'm like, Put this crap in reverse and use whatever hood race skills you have to get us out of here. So we take my poor 95 caddy that really shouldn't be driving on a dirt road anyway and back up all the way down that road and get back to the main road. Relieved, we take a different road home. Then, lo and behold, the same guy is parked on that road, standing off to the side, smiling, just looking into our headlights. We were completely about to crap ourselves and we gunned it for the rest of the way home. I don't know how he got there before us or what his intentions were, but I'm thankful I wasn't alone being my naive college girl self. Bonus file, written by No Competition, 8871. The Little Girl Crying by the Pond. I was hearing howling one night and early morning too, not long ago, and I also had been thinking about skinwalkers, reading about them. Well tonight, I was outside with my cousin, helping him set up his new basketball hoop. We got finished with it, and he was shooting some hoops while I was watching. It's about dusk. Then he asked me if I want to go inside, and I say sure, and then all of a sudden I hear, help me, please help me, someone please help. It sounded like a little girl crying for help near our pond. I was shaking and my cousin had already gone inside the door but was waiting for me. 
At this point, I'm shaking because it's almost like I knew what it was as soon as I heard it. My cousin came back out and I no longer heard it. Then I'm shaking my way back inside to tell my fiancé and she just looks out of the bathroom window because it's looking out towards the pond and she sees a little girl out there. Then she tells me to come look, not even 10 seconds later, there's nothing there. What the hell is happening? First it was knocking and howling, we're having actual experiences, I'm seriously terrified. I checked for any sign of an actual little girl and there was no sign anyone had actually been down there. So there was nothing to find, nowhere to look for a real girl. It wasn't a real girl and I know it wasn't. I know who lives around this area and I know what happens around here. It's not just some distressed kid, I promise. I'm about 60% native and also just had a child. Lots of negative things are going on in the family right now. It's chaotic and it's feeding off of these things. This wasn't a little girl that was kidnapped or anything like that. My fiance saw her out by the pond on the grass. She couldn't have fallen in in 10 seconds and there was no sign, there was no splashing in the water, no ripples and also when I checked it this morning there were no footprints or hair or shoes or clothes or anything. It was muddy enough to see if someone had been there last night. I'm gonna start catching all this on camera, footage of this would be incredible and would help put our minds at some sense of ease. Case file number 1031, written by worker 11811, Georgie, the omniscient homeless man. I was working on a no-budget film, a really trashy script, weird plot, no redeeming values at all. Toward the end of production, me and the director were going around getting second unit inserts. We were on 59th street at 6am on Sunday morning unloading the camera. We were going up to a penthouse he knew of to get a shot looking down into Central Park. No one knew about the film other than the production crew and actors, it would never ever have been mentioned in any media. So the director and I are unloading and there's no one around except for one homeless man. He's shuffling along the sidewalk, heading in our direction. He's one of the sad, mentally ill people that our society refuses to help. So his schizophrenia is untreated and he's out on the streets and he's talking to himself non-stop as he comes along. When he gets close to us, he looks at us and says, and here are those guys that are making that movie about and he proceeds to rattle off the entire plotline as he walks past, as if he were reading the IMDB synopsis. None of our equipment was visible, so there was no way that anyone would recognize us as a film crew. The director and I just looked at each other like, what just happened? Case file number 1032, written by Friendship Wins. The universe gave us a wink. This summer, I had bought my girlfriend a last minute birthday trip to go kayaking around the San Juan Islands off the Washington state coast. After a long drive and ferry trip, we found the tour group of about 20 people and were then shuffled into a shuttle van for a ride to the beach. Now, my girlfriend has a unique name similar to the name of a famous painter. Let's say it's Rebecca Warhol, just for fun, it's not. She's a little ray of sunshine and started chatting with the middle-aged woman sitting next to her on the shuttle as we waited to leave. The woman noted that she always had loved the name Rebecca as it was her mother's name. They made pleasant small talk in the van until the tour guide passed around the sign-in sheet for all of us to fill out. That's when things got strange. My girlfriend wrote her full name on the sheet and passed it on to the woman who immediately shouted, oh my god, and started crying. After a few minutes of total confusion, she told us, Rebecca Warhol was my mother's full name and these islands were her favorite place in the world. She passed away this summer from cancer and we've traveled hundreds of miles to spread her ashes here. We were stunned. I literally picked a random date, time and tour company and then we were split into the same group as this woman and my girlfriend was sitting right next to her on the shuttle. What the hell? She continued by saying, my daughter told us that Nana Rebecca would be with us on this trip and I didn't believe it until now. It was the most unbelievable coincidence we had ever experienced and has totally convinced me that there's more to this world than we think. As my brother later said, the universe winked at us that day. Case file number 1033, written by Noel Savinella. No really, that's just Nutella. Grandma has unlimited magical power. This happened a while ago, so bear with me as I try to recall the story. Anyway, I always try to look for the logical reasoning behind a weird occurrence, which I don't have many of. 
But this experience, man, I have no idea how I could even try to explain it. Back in 2015, my mother and I were returning from the mall after doing some last minute prom shopping. Unfortunately, we left just as rush hour started. Anyone who lives in the city knows how nightmarish rush hour can get. I had this urge to look out the driver's side window and I spotted my grandma in the car next to us. It was even the same make and model that she always drove. At first I thought, wow, what a coincidence, she was on the same road as us. I remember pointing her out to my mother, who did a double take and muttered something about how she didn't realize my grandma was back from vacation. I had completely forgotten she was in Mexico and lived two hours away from us. This woman, besides us, had everything my grandma had. The same mole, the same glasses, the same assortment of beads and air fresheners hanging from her mirror. It was her, but when we tried to get her attention, she didn't seem to notice us or maybe she was ignoring us. Either way, she ended up turning off the highway. When we got home, I ran to my room and checked Facebook, her go-to social media. She just posted a recent picture of her swimming in the ocean, still in Mexico. I messaged her to ensure she was still on vacation and lo and behold, she was. I told my mom and she explained it as we saw someone that looked exactly like her. I would generally accept that explanation if it weren't for all the items and defining features that confirmed that woman was, in fact, my grandmother. To this day, I have no idea what happened that day. Case file number 1034, written by X Canuti. I was teleported by the Winter Goddess. One thing I've always done while driving is gauge where I am on landmarks and not signs. Just anything out of the ordinary I see, I'll know exactly how far I've gone and how long until I get there. Well, I live in Alaska, and I was driving to pick up my sister from the airport about an hour away around midnight in the middle of the winter. It's pitch black, and there's not many landmarks I base myself off of on this drive, but there is one in particular every winter next to an on-ramp. There is this single spruce tree that is lit up with Christmas lights. Every time you pass it, you notice it. There's no other lights, especially being in the middle of the winter, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Well, I pass this, and I make a mental note of it knowing where I'm at, what time it is, and how long it'll take me to get to the airport. Well, I keep driving, and about 10 minutes later, I pass the tree again? Time has changed since the last mental note I took, but for some reason, I don't remember the last 10 minutes of driving, but I know I already passed this very specific tree. It shook me up so bad I had to pull over and collect myself. Still flucks me up to think about today. Case file number 1035, written by Rin6. The universe went grocery shopping for me. I am the kind of person who keeps a list of everything they have in their fridge and freezer. I'm definitely more organized and meticulous than the average person. Everything in my kitchen has a place and a label. Last night, I remember as clear as anything, making myself some pasta. I added some frozen peas for vegetables. I remember that there was only a bit left in the bag afterwards, so on my grocery list in the fridge, I wrote that I needed to buy peas. Shortly afterwards, I went to bed. This morning, I woke up, opened the freezer, and there, in the exact place as my almost empty bag of peas, is a brand new, unopened bag of the same brand. I did not buy peas. By the time I ate dinner, the store was already closed. My freezer is small. I only buy one bag of vegetables at a time because there's just no space. I was so freaked out by this, I checked my carbon monoxide detector and rummaged through the past two months of grocery receipts to find that I have only bought one bag of peas in this time. I don't think someone would have broken in because one, who does that? And two, the alarm on my door would have gone off. I am so confused. Case file number 1036, written by Vardigir. To repeat. The place we lived at at the time, a few years ago, was a house on a gravel dead-end road across from a church. The church had two drives, because it had a circle drive that went under an overhang, but there was no drive behind or around the church, none. One way in, one way out, that gravel dead-end road. I was babysitting, the kids I nannied for and mine were all playing outside in the side yard. No one went around the back of the house, because there was poison ivy, so we were always in the front or side, always in view of the road. 
the church's groundskeeper, comes down the cross street, turns on the gravel, in a dark gray Honda, the same car he's driven for years. Smiles, nods, and waves. The church was good neighbors, nice guy. He drove slowly past, through the church's parking lot, to park in front of the garage beyond the church, which is also in view. I wasn't watching him. I was watching the kids. But I was facing the church, all of this in my field of view. I was thinking to myself a few minutes later that he must be working on equipment inside today. He hadn't walked back through the parking lot to the church. Then I hear tires on gravel. Look up at the cross street again. Here comes the dark gray Honda. I stared at it confused. The church groundskeeper smiles, nods, and waves, just like normal, just like he did ten minutes ago. I whip my head around, and there's no car in front of the church's garage. This car goes and parks there like normal. About a minute later, he strolls back along the parking lot, checking out the landscaping. I cannot state firmly enough that there is only one single way in and out of our goofy little enclave. And that was gravel, and it makes a sound I look up at every time I hear it, reflexively. It was not long enough for him to have come, left, done something, and returned. It was maybe 10 to 15 minutes at most, and he did not leave. I would have seen that, and if I wasn't looking, I would have heard it and looked. The guy came almost daily, same guy, same car, same smile, and wave. He just showed up twice. Varda gear is my guess. Someone explained that concept when I shared this on Facebook, feeling like I'd gone crazy. Case notes for file 997, the ancient Neolithic time anomaly. So I'm wondering, did the ancestors that used to live there, did they build these monuments and all of this interesting stuff around the site because in this specific location, they knew that weird things would happen, such as this time anomaly? Is it related to that specific location? It's a very interesting idea, and perhaps it is. For them, of course, they would attribute it to the gods or other mysteries of the universe that have no possible answer. They wouldn't have any knowledge of glitches in the Matrix or the idea of a simulation. It wouldn't even be speculative possibility. It does seem that there are specific areas of the world where time will flow inconsistently, perhaps pause or slow down tremendously, but only for certain individuals. For others, they don't notice anything different happening. So it's down to perception of time, maybe not time itself. I wonder if you actually lost a minute, if there was a, a gap of a minute that you would have noticed if you uh, had checked your phone before this and after. Was time still flowing freely for everyone else? And it was just your perception that was garbled for some reason. Something about that environment, connecting with your mind, had that effect. It seems like. Case notes for file 998. My mom put me to bed? So yeah, the obvious question here is, was your mom astrally projecting? Was it her spirit that pushed you to bed? Uh, that came to see you in bed? Or was it just her sleepwalking? Well, I don't think it's sleepwalking because it just happened once, as you said, it didn't happen again or before. A single case of sleepwalking and it never happens again? I don't think that's how it works. I could be wrong. But if it's not, then yeah, it would just be her soul paying you a visit for some reason. But it still begs the question of why. You know, we have all these accounts of things happening. I'm very confident of all these things happening. Ghosts, spirits, time anomalies, quantum immortality. Quantum immortality seems like a property of the universe, kind of like asking why uh, gravity exists or why the electromagnetic force exists. It's just a fundamental nature. There's no trigger needed besides death. But for all these other glitches, it seems like a trigger is needed, but it's not clear what that trigger is. Why, if a person is able to astrally project, is it just in specific cases? I guess it's a certain mental state that's required? Perhaps she was thinking very fondly of you, very intensely about you, while in dream state, and that projected her soul towards you, to comfort you. It's kinda wholesome, pretty. I don't know if that's how it works, but it makes sense. Case notes for the creepy file number 81. The Cuyahoga Valley Shadow Monster. So my first thought was of concern for the little girl. I do hope that her scream was merely reaction to seeing the shadow monster as well. And not that it attacked her or anything like that. Of course, you're just kids. I don't blame you for not rushing towards that sound of danger. Bolting home is probably what I would have done as well. I'm not a Bigfoot kind of guy. I mean, maybe. Maybe Bigfoot exists. But it's certainly true, I think, that there are plenty of beasts and animals out there that we haven't fully discovered and mapped out yet. The world is just too big to have discovered it all. Maybe plenty of them live in caves or stuff. Like The Descent, which is one of the most terrifying horror movies ever made. 
don't watch it unless you want to be petrified for the rest of your life. And uh, definitely don't go in spelunking in caves. Don't recommend it. And now time for the quote of the day. Do not go where the path may lead. Instead, go where there is no path and make your own. Ralph Waldo Emerson. I love this quote. I think it's all about charting your own destiny. I don't like the idea of fate. Maybe we live in a buffered reality, but we still made our own choices, and the universe we play through is of our own making, our own choices. You don't want to live in an environment where, no matter what you do, the end result is guaranteed. No. You want to be able to explore the unexplorable. You know, this is something I've noticed in MMORPGs, is that the magic is lost nowadays because there's too much information. Everything is instantly known, even for a brand new game. So what's the point? There's no discovery to be had anymore. Discovery is the key. As they say, knowledge is kind of a curse. It saps the fun out of life. If there's no mystery, what's the point? Case notes are file 999. I predicted a mysterious figure would give me Spider-Man. Yeah, this would be classic foresight from the dream realm. I think especially when we're dreaming, we're more attuned to the entire universe and all of its information. Any external stimuli that may exist that we're not aware of when we're in our conscious state is there for the plucking when we're dreaming. Most people can't access it, even when dreaming. But I think especially when you're younger, your brain is more open to the possibility of using that, that information. You're not closed off to it yet. So in essence, I don't think the man was supernatural in any way. I think it was just an ordinary, good Samaritan, charitable man. And you simply downloaded the information of the coming day. What he would do. It's kind of cool that you were thinking about receiving this gift and it just happened so quickly after. But I think that's just a coincidence. I think the fact that you downloaded the information is the glitch part. Sort of glitch, you could say. Case notes are file 1000. When the postmaster delivers a thousandth glitch. Well, look at that. We hit a thousand glitches. On the channel, anyways. I narrated a few before I officially started to number them, but still. Awesome. Woohoo! <laughs> Onward to 10,000 now. So, I have heard of stories where people receive mail extremely late, and I would imagine that there is some glitch in the system in terms of however they organize mail, and would depend on your local post office as well. So that, that could happen, that it's just a very delayed piece of mail. But I have to say, it's a weird business model. I mean, imagine ordering McDonald's and receiving it seven years later. I think you'd be a bit irate. <laughs> but yeah, what are the odds that this would happen on the day your father was discharged from the ER from some health scare? And then also, the fact that it's in your handwriting, you don't remember ever sending it, and it, it wasn't even addressed properly because it was wishing your mom a happy birthday when it's eight months late, or I guess four months early, however you want to think of it. I don't, I don't know, unless it's, it's literally a piece of mail from a different universe that somehow wound up here, and then in that universe you have a different birthday too, but that's, that's a very massive difference, so I don't know. Honestly, outside of some weird prank, I got nothing. What a trippy glitch. And uh, it's kind of cool, kind of fitting for the thousandth glitch to be stumped. Yay! <laughs> Sometimes it's fun when you don't know the answer. Case notes are file 1001. When a delicious brew spills itself. I see two possibilities here. The first is that the universe is losing cohesion, which there are plenty of signs to that, like uh, the black dots and objects disappearing and reappearing all the time. It seems like the universe is taking physics as a mere suggestion now and not a immutable law of itself. It's also possible that a spirit was involved. Prankster, I guess. It's not very funny. I guess a bit. Maybe in the chaotic, neutral kind of fun, just uh, for itself, the spirit. Kind of giving me Hogwarts Peeves vibes. You gotta step up your pranks there, buddy. Case notes for the bonus file. My husband came home without coming home. So I would say this could just be classic astral projection. Your husband projected his spirit all the way into the home without being there. Maybe because his mind was so thinking, Yeah, I really want to be home, but I'm stuck at work. That's possible. Could have just been thinking of you, and missing you, his wife, and wanting to be home with you. The other possibility though, because you mentioned the monitor system that picked something up twice that wasn't there. Maybe it is some, uh, some kind of spirit involved in this case. I'm not sure I'm kind of split between both, but those are the obvious possibilities in my mind. And now time for the quote of the day. If life were predictable, it would cease to be life and lose its flavor. Eleanor Roosevelt. Indeed, I connect very well with this quote. I think, if we reach a state where we know everything, 
then the magic is lost. What else is there to work towards? I mean, I guess you can still enjoy the fun of life, you know, food and going out and stuff. But without any discovery, it's kind of, eh, kind of like a mental entropy. A state of total equilibrium. Nothing else. No downs, but no highs either. I hope we don't reach that, and I don't think we're anywhere close to that, so keep on discovering. Case notes are file 1002. When an alien visits the dentist. So we humans are, well any animal really, are incredibly varied, and it comes down to evolution. Our genetics are a blueprint to design us. Basically, if you want to build a house, you need an instruction set to follow, where to put the studs and the wide beams and so on and all the nails and everything else. Of course, the human body is immensely complex, unimaginably so. <laughs> It'd be like trying to build a billion homes within a tiny confine and it's figuring out a way to do it, where every process interacts with each other, amino acids and proteins inside of cells communicating with each other and taking instructions from our DNA in terms of what to do. Even though they're not thinking entities, they're just the computer code. It's operating on a set sequence based on parameters that are defined by our own DNA. It's incredible, really. Every person is going to have slightly different DNA instruction sets, and these mutations can lead to interesting effects. Often, they have no effect, because it's changing DNA that doesn't really affect anything. A lot of our DNA is like basic instruction sets, but it's not going to change a higher level function. But if you do change one of those higher level functions or expressions, then you can have different traits entirely, you know. Some people are born with six fingers instead of five. Other people are born with extra things. <laughs> it's like, suffice to say, we are all slightly different. Now, most of us are similar enough that medical science still applies, but in cases like this, maybe rare cases where someone, they should still have blood, of course, but not feeling pain, some people literally don't feel pain. And it's actually a detriment to survival, so it's not a gene that would be passed on, because it reduces your chance of reproducing. Still, the idea that she has a high pain tolerance is entirely possible in my mind. It's the lack of blood that makes no sense. Was this actually an alien? And if it was, why did they go to the dentist? Do they just want to examine how dentistry works? I guess maybe they'd have a fascination with that. And certainly you would know as the expert dentist that during these operations, there would always be blood. It's not something you could mistake. You know, it's not just poking someone with a little cleaning brush and like, no, there should be blood. No, this is chopping up a tooth or whatever you said. I believe you that there should be blood. And if there wasn't, that is an unexplainable anomaly to me. Don't know if it was an alien. That might just be my bias. Probably is. It's something. Case notes for file 1003. When words are amplified beyond reasoning. So likewise, I like to explain glitches away or anomalies, try to figure out what could cause them. If it's just normal science, that's cool. Uh, in this case, you do mention, you know, air ducts, vents, anything that could move the compressed air that is sound through a medium to reach your ears. But even if it was through a vent, maybe if it was like right next to your ear, then it could sound like it's coming, but even then there would be like an echo effect. You would be able to know it's not just from your, someone standing behind you or something. Maybe that could have explained it, but like you say, there were no air ducts or anything. You even tried to talk in the room where they were, and no one heard it after the fact. So something happened there that carried the voice over. Now, did it actually compress the air and somehow just amplify it? Well, probably not. No one else reported hearing some gigantic boom that would be required to transmit the pressure wave that far. So it seems like, for some reason, maybe because they were thinking so intently about you, their voice carried telepathically into your mind. That's a rare one. Not one you hear about too often, but I, I guess if we're able to push our souls forward, astrally project in the world, then maybe we can do the same with our own thoughts directly. Rather interesting, but it's not something that I hear about often. In fact, I don't know if I've read a glitch like this before. Maybe once or twice, but usually it's more of an instinct that the other person feels, like someone they love is in trouble or hurt, but not directly hearing their thoughts. That's a new one. Case notes for the creepy file number 82, Night Park Terrors. So again, we're reaching points where there are creatures that are appearing all over the place it seems, like on roads and forests and everything, where fear is evoked, and I don't know if they're trying to make themselves seem more terrifying than they are, or these are real monsters that are messing with people's brains, but they're actually terrifying and mean as harm. It didn't chase you, whatever it was, and it really is the most important point that your mind couldn't even process what it was seeing. Maybe it was an alien. 
And just to say, you know, if aliens are here, they probably would have technology that could warp our perception of something. And if we're seeing it, we instinctively know we're not supposed to. <laughs> now, of course, why would an alien be in, uh, not Central Park, but equivalent to Central Park in wherever city or town you live in? I don't know. It seems very odd altogether. I don't think any random beast would have that kind of power. It doesn't seem quite right. And what the hell was it doing in the middle of a city park? I haven't heard of any stories where someone is reporting in a city area to be attacked by any kind of wild beast or supernatural fear inducer. You'd think there'd be reports of that, so maybe it was just hiding and it didn't want to be found at all. This is like its defense mechanism to make you run away instead of having to fight. And now time for the story of the day. Once upon a time, in a small village, nestled at the foot of a great mountain, there lived a young boy named Taro. Taro was known throughout the village for his kind heart, quick wit, and unquenchable thirst for adventure. One day, Taro decided to climb the great mountain that loomed over the village. Many people had tried before him, but none had succeeded. Undeterred, Taro set out on his quest, determined to reach the summit. As Taro climbed higher and higher, the air grew thin and the terrain grew more treacherous. He slipped and stumbled, but he always got back up and kept going. Finally, after many days of climbing, Taro reached the summit. The view was breathtaking. He could see for miles and miles and the sun was beginning to set, casting the sky in a magnificent array of colors. But, as Taro gazed out at the beautiful vista before him, he felt a deep sense of loneliness. He had achieved his goal, but he had done it alone. He realized that the true beauty of life comes not just from reaching our goals, but from sharing our experiences with others. With this newfound wisdom, Taro made his way back down the mountain and returned to his village. From that day on, he devoted his life to helping others and bringing people together so that they could share in the beauty of life with each other. And so the moral of the story is this. Life's greatest joys are meant to be shared with others. Whether we're climbing mountains or simply enjoying a beautiful sunset, we should always seek to bring others along with us on our journey. Everything is better with other people. Even though I'm an introvert, I still believe this. And if you don't have someone else to share your experiences with, at least get a pet. You know, having a dog by your side is <laughs> such a massive boost to one's morale and happiness. But really, you want to find someone that you can love. Not just sexual, you know, that's, that's to the side. It's not the most important thing. It's someone that you connect with emotionally, intellectually, and can share in all the struggles of life. Not just the achievements and the, the rewards, but the struggles too. That's how we build character. That's why going to the gym is awesome. Even though it's a struggle, you're pushing your body to its limits and beyond. But that's the point. You want to grow together. Case notes are file 1004. We took a trip on a road that never existed. Yeah, you were very thorough in your attempt to explain away this anomaly or mystery. Thinking about tree loggings, uh, abandoned railway tracks, and all kinds of manner of weird and unusual explanations. But I think those would be rather rational. But to me, it's very clearly a glitch because there are no railway lines running anywhere nearby the route that you were on. So it's inexplicable. It's not like they just came by and removed them. Plus Google Maps, the satellite images, would uh, have buffered images. They're not like updated every day or anything. I think it's every year some like, or months. So you would have seen it. The only explanation to me is that you were temporarily in a new universe, one where there is indeed a rail line running in that area with this extremely narrow road that is just uh, bizarre. I've never been down a road so narrow that there would be foliage on each side that would touch the car. I guess maybe if it was just unkept, a completely abandoned road, but it's just this game we play. There are plenty of concurrently running simulations or versions of the game, and some are very different, like in this case. And just for a moment, you were occupied in that different universe. For some reason, I don't know why there are crossovers sometimes. Quantum immortality is clear, but that's, that's well defined. There's a single parameter. You have to die first, and then your soul moves over permanently, unless you die again. But in these cases, there's just temporary crossovers. Maybe there's places in the world where the membrane is thin enough where you just cross over. But why are you pulled back then? What is governing that action? It's unclear. But this would also explain why your boyfriend didn't understand what you were talking about because for him, there was no crossover at all. It was just the normal road that you always take. There was no mini level crossing or railroad or narrow road. Nothing like that. Case notes for file 1005. The brightest UFO.
No, definitely not crazy. The uh, bright light is usually indicative of some kind of memory wipe, and the sense of uh, confusion is also associated with this. Whatever form of memory suppression that aliens use when they abduct people isn't perfect. Yeah, it'll suppress your memories almost always, unless you actively try to go back and retrieve them via hypnotherapy. But uh, just a normal experience, you'll feel confused, dazed, disoriented, perplexed, but you won't know exactly what happened. The memory won't be there. Sometimes they implant false memories, it seems, as well, but maybe that's more advanced and doesn't work on everyone. For everyone else, it's just a gap, where you don't understand how you got from the porch to the kitchen sink with hot water running. But the only good news I can offer is that I don't believe these aliens are malicious. Maybe not exactly aligned with our ethics, you know, to abduct someone is rather not exactly a good act, but they, they wouldn't think of it. The worst case, I think, is that they see us more like we would view ants, so they're not trying to exterminate us, they just don't really care, or think of us as that relevant or worthy of moral consideration. Hopefully not. One way or another, though, it's pretty clear that they want to understand us, physically at least, so they're abducting and studying us. In a way, indifference is almost more terrifying, but we can only speculate on that and just hope for the best. And now time for the quote of the day. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeeded. Michael Jordan. Now isn't that something to think about? It's um, reminiscent of Thomas Edison and the uh, thousand light bulbs, 999 times attempts to get it right, all failures, every single time thinking, I'm pathetic, I'm worthless, I can't do this, there's nothing, I am, it's hopeless. But it's not. If you just keep going, you'll eventually get there. It might take 10,000 tries, I don't know. The only guarantee is if you give up, you'll never be successful. So don't give up. Keep going. Success is right around the corner. Case notes for file 1006. The police officer that teleported me to safety. I wonder what mixture guardian angels have with quantum immortality. So if you consider that quantum immortality were saved from death in a certain sense, or we die in the one universe but we're, our soul is preserved and moved over to a different universe, I'm always wondering if there's a limit to how far we can travel in the multiversal ocean. You know, the islands that pepper out the uh, ocean are the universes, and then between it there's still some medium. I don't know if it's just like physical space in the universe or it's something else, but presumably there is some kind of distance between the two. Or even if they're right next to each other, there's still, if you want to go to one, to the one at the far end, a billion universes away, presumably that would take time. Maybe not. But if it does... There may be a preference for the transfer to take place to the nearest one possible. Now, maybe you die in like a billion universes in a row in the same way, and then the billionth and one, that's the only one left where you can be saved. But maybe the universe has a, has a preference to keep you closer, and so to do that, they'll rewind time slightly, or offer some kind of guardian angel program. Maybe that's what this cop was. Of course, to you, you'll just see him as a cop, but... In reality, it was just a program of the simulation that was saving you. Kind of like a good Agent Smith. In the Matrix, of course. I think that's a pretty cool idea. Case notes for file 1007. Impossible British music. So, auditory hallucinations certainly do happen. They are real. There's a explosive head syndrome, for instance. But usually it doesn't manifest as entire lyrics, clear as day. I wonder if your phone somehow picked up a signal from someone else playing nearby, a similar song. Or was it just a momentary broadcast from a different universe, one where the song that you're listening to, Rural Britannia, was with a different lyric in two overall. Or maybe just a variant in their universe, it's possible. I do often wonder just how many other songs or paintings or works of art or stories or movies or TV shows or games there are in other copies of the universes out there. How many variations of things we love, like Harry Potter, in a different universe, a billion leagues away. Did J.K. Rowling also write Harry Potter, but maybe a bit differently? Maybe Harry Potter is a girl. Maybe he's actually very powerful in that book, in that version. And Voldemort is evil, but maybe a bit misunderstood. I don't know. Just variations that could be interesting. I hope there's a way to go back and experience them all. That would require 
the real world to be almost eternal, and then we just can spend all of our days just experiencing each variation and copy, and just learning about ourselves and how what we like, and ah, it's just too cool. <laughs> like the holodeck in Star Trek, but taken to uh, quite the extreme. And now time for the quote of the day. It's hard to beat a person that never gives up. Babe Ruth. Yeah, very similar to Michael Jordan's quote. The same kind of moral to it, I would say. The whole point and premise of life is never to give up. As soon as you give up, you're essentially putting the controller down and just saying, well, life can't get better, I'm not good enough, or life is too oppressive, and you know, maybe both are true in a certain sense, but you can improve yourself and you can succeed in spite of how difficult life is. Now yeah, there are extreme situations where there's just nothing you can really do, but even then, like if you're born in Kenya or something, you know, a very poor country, you can still try to make the best of your environment. It is sad, of course, in a way that life is so uneven, but you can't really change it. All you can do is try to make the best of the hand that you're dealt. There's great pride in that. Not to be the best in the world, but to be the best you can be. Case notes for file 1008. The Shack of Whispers. Well, this was an incredible story to read. Thank you for sharing it. And I'm really sorry that it hit you so hard. But just know, I don't think that makes you weak or inferior in any way. If it happened to me, I might have reacted the same way. Dependency on something else to mask the immense weight it placed on your soul and your mind. It kind of sounds like whatever entities they were, were preying on your good nature and your childlike innocence, and they robbed that of you. It's almost like Dementors in Harry Potter, but unlike there, it doesn't go away after they leave. Maybe chocolate will help? <laughs> I mean, chocolate's always good, so you can't, uh, can't go wrong with trying that. Have an entire Hershey bar, you have a good excuse. And you didn't do what they wanted, which in my estimation is a good thing. I don't know exactly what the whole... It's like a ritual that they were trying to invoke. I don't know what exactly it would do, but I'm glad that you didn't go along with it. The first time you did it, where the candle was lit, and then time elapsed, where you thought it was summer, but then it was fall. That's so mysterious. Because everyone adapted to your being there, like normal. You know, it's not like you went missing for a few months. So it's almost like you were temporarily moved forward, but in a timeline where you had already done all the actions you would normally have done. But it also kind of feels like a different universe, because you, you say your dad acted differently, hugging you where he normally wouldn't have. It's altogether quite mysterious. And now time for the quote of the day. Nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. Aubrey Hepburn. I do love wordplay, so this is masterclass level. I'm possible. Yes. <laughs> so, technically, untrue. There are things that are literally impossible to do, like bench pressing a mountain. Within the context of reasonable possibility and the laws of basic physics, yes. And if your mindset is that this is possible, you're gonna get somewhere with that mindset. It's better to have that mindset than to think that, ah, uh, it's almost everything is impossible, it's not even worth trying. Like I'm always saying, if you don't try, you're guaranteed to fail. It's no way to go through life. Case notes for file 1009. The universe is running out of NPCs. So the obvious suggestion that many people would have and did have is that this is some sort of face blindness. I forgot the exact technical name for that. It's where people can't distinguish one face to another. Thing is, you describe the personality changes as well, and you're not saying that every single person in your life is, you know, looks like someone else, just a lot of them do. If you're able to differentiate some faces, or most faces, it's just that many others do look similar, then I wouldn't say it's face blindness. I don't know if it's actual NPCs of the universe. It's a question I've had. How many people, human beings that are out there, are truly connected to a soul? And with so many iterations of so many copies of universes in the great multiverse, I'm wondering, are there base templates that are just operating similar to how their copies would operate, but they don't necessarily have a soul connected? And just in general, there may be plenty of NPCs running around, you know, hyper-advanced AI, I mean, hell, in this universe, if this is a simulation, we already have AI that can replicate human beings pretty well. Nothing close enough to quite pass in the long term, but if we live in a simulation, then the AI running it, the computer would be hyper advanced. So is it possible that some human beings are literally just NPCs? Maybe. I won't presume that by in any individual I meet, but in a general sense, yeah. And then there's a question of, 
can we choose to connect to a character that was going through the motions and was just a character in the, the universe? It wasn't an actively connected player later in life. You know, you think, oh, you die. That's the last uh, person you have in any universe. And then you wake up in the real world. Well, then can you just immediately jump back into an, a grown adult or do you have to start as a baby? Maybe you can just jump into a later stage of life. Kind of fascinating, Rudy. Case notes are file 1010. I saw my twin, but the proof was erased. So this is very peculiar. If it's just a universal switch, then that means that in the original universe, you did actually have your twin that you were seeing. And then you switch universes, and in that case, there was no twin of you in that universe, or he just wasn't in that venue where you were staying or exploring. Otherwise, I mean, it's not just an astral projection of yourself because it was a picture, you know, it was uh, posted on the board. Unless we go back to the, the idea I had where an astral projection could literally just be out there living its own life, completely oblivious to the fact that it's just a fragment of a soul of someone else. That's a bit out there and probably not the case. An unlikely event of seeing your twin in a picture and then switching universes. And in that one, no one knew what the hell's going on. Or it could also be a timeline fix. That wasn't supposed to happen. You weren't supposed to see the you there, and not seeing it will produce better results in the long run for whatever timeline reason that the universe has. Because I think there are alterations made in the buffer sometimes. I think that's much rarer though than just moving universes. Alterations are last resort, I guess you could say. Case notes are file 1011. The washing machine that twists reality. So this reminds me of the story I narrated where someone, I think it was just, um, uh, he might still have been a kid, but he, uh, he grew up in the same place and they always had an oak table or it might have been always a glass table and then it switched to an oak table or vice versa, but it did switch by his perception. But his parents didn't think uh, it switched and when he checked pictures going back, it was always either a glass or oak table, like the parents were saying, but to his memory, it was the other thing is, in that story, it didn't switch back. In this case, the washing machines do. So what the hell's going on there? Is it just a double transition? Double quantum immortality? Or were you just temporarily in that other universe for some reason without it being quantum immortality? That does happen. More rare for that to happen and also interact with people in those universes. Maybe there was that one case in the story with Subway. There's so many mind warping events that go on because of all these universal transitions that aren't explainable exactly the, the reasons why they happen outside of quantum immortality, which is simple. The rest is unclear as to the cause, but still fascinating to read. Case notes for the bonus file. My Phantom Beagle. So is this a case of, again, peering into a different universe when you're upstairs, where your beagle was in that universe upstairs just sitting by the uh, child seat? Maybe not chewing on the toy, but still just chilling there. Then you go downstairs, you're back in your normal universe, and the beagle was downstairs. Obviously, it didn't actually move in any physical space, just different universes. There's also, of course, astral projection. Maybe because she was too lazy to actually walk upstairs to go chill by the child seat. I know some dogs can be lazy. Mr. Ben has been kind of lazy as of late, and refusing to eat kibble. I have to give him wet food now. He's uh, such a gourmet fancy pants. He needs to do the fancy pants dance and get Michelle out here. I wonder if Red and Link will uh, rent her out for just an evening. Maybe Mr. Ben will be happier after that. And now time for the quote of the day. The bad news is that time flies. The good news is you're the pilot. Michael Altschuler. Indeed, and you can be the ace pilot. You can be Tom Cruise if you want to be. Not literally, but you can have his mindset. <laughs> pilot that plane extremely fast, but be precise. It's keen to know what you want to do and what you want to grasp out of life. We're always moving in time and space, mostly in time. And then you have to decide, okay, I can steer the ship. I can't stop it. I can't make it go much faster or much at all in the technology we have. So I just, I know I'm moving. I know I'm moving forward and I know my speed. Where do I want to go? Think about that. Where do you want to see yourself in five years, 10 years? Maybe it'll take a bit longer or a bit quicker, but you need to know where you want to go. Otherwise, you're wandering aimlessly through the desert with no compass. You're not going to get anywhere. Case notes for file 10,012. The Devil's Footprints. So your friend's uncle was kind of a badass. Imagine hearing about some amphibian demonic goat beast and then wanting to go after it with a shovel. Damn. <laughs> Hardcore, I'd say. 
So apparently in Russia they fight bears. I guess in Spain they fight demon goats? You learn something new every day. <laughs> now of course, was it really a demon? Probably not, or the devil. It makes you wonder though, because your, your computer crashed when you wanted to share it. It's almost like there was an entity spotting you, tethered to you, and knew your intent because you watched the video you say thousands of times from your computer, but only the time you wanted to share it, that's when the hard drive was corrupted. Now yeah, maybe that part is just a coincidence, a really strange one, but it, it's possible, you know, hard drives fail. Especially older disk style hard drives, not SSDs. SSDs also fail, but it's uh, less common unless you're writing to it a lot. You have that instance where it could certainly be just coincidence. And in that case, yeah, maybe this is actually just some kind of amphibian hybrid beast that we've never seen before. The world is unfathomably vast. I think people don't quite appreciate how big it is. Is it possible there's some creature out there that can breathe on land and also underwater, or at least underwater for some amount of time, maybe not permanently, so it came from deeper in the ocean and just came on shore? You have to ask yourself a few questions on that though, because for a species to propagate, it probably needs a fair few of them, and you'd think we would have seen some by now, because if they do frequently come ashore, someone would have seen it by that point. Is it just some beast that we haven't discovered yet? There's certainly a few stories about that. Or is it some entity manifesting itself in physical form? And we know that it is really physical form because the phone captured it. It wasn't just in your mind. That is the most interesting aspect to the story, that it really was physically real, whatever it was. An entity with physical form that had red glowing eyes. Damn. That definitely sounds like it's meant to be perceived as a threat, one way or another. And now time for the quote of the day. He who has a why to live can bear any how. Nietzsche. It's like when you go to the gym. You don't go there just to lift and hold on to weight for no reason. You have a purpose in mind. A reason that gives you the motivation and discipline to continue to go every single day, well, or every other day, however often you go, but consistently. You need to have that core guiding north star of your life to know where you want to go, what direction you're moving towards, and the reason why that goal matters to you. You have to figure that out, and the earlier the better. Of course, for most people it takes quite a long time. And honestly, it's not really taught in schools. You're not told to find the reason why you want to focus on your life, the reason why you want to direct yourself to, with all your energy and might and intellect and wisdom towards any given area. You're just said, well, study this stuff and, you know, if you like something cool, it's not enough. You need more. What is your reason for being? If you find that, I think you'll be able to say, no matter what happens, I got this. Case notes are file 10,013. I am the immortal driver. So this is a wild confluence of glitches and if quantum immortality is involved, which you'd think it could be because in a situation like that, driving on the freeway in heavy rain, with such heavy rain that you can't see with the wipers going full blast, next to a 18-wheeler, yeah, probably something bad happened there. But it's not the end of the, the discussion because you know that you literally traveled faster than physically possible because of the text and because your friend reacted to the point where they didn't understand at all how it's possible you traveled in that length of time. If somehow it was just quantum immortality and you, you left earlier than you thought in the other universe, well, your friend wouldn't have reacted in a way that seemed that would suggest that it's odd. No, no, no. It really is a point where somehow you had a quantum immortality event, probably. Maybe you didn't, actually. And maybe this is just a time glitch. Maybe the perceived glitchiness of the driving event where you had this, uh, maybe it was kind of like precognition where you knew something was coming, your mind snapped you out of it with this loud sound that wasn't real. It was just what well, was real of what would have happened if you didn't wake up. And then you perceive the splash of water on the, the windshield from the 18-wheeler as very loud. But that simply could be because you're in this daze from being in and out of consciousness. You know, when you first wake up, if someone wakes you up, uh, even a tiny noise can sound like insanely loud or even a touch can feel really intense because your mind's not all there yet, still um, rebooting. That I could see as maybe not even being a glitch in that context. May have been, you may have been in a new universe, but it's not related to the time glitch. It seems like there's also this space-time portal involved where you somehow traveled much further 
in a tiny amount of time compared to what you're supposed to be able to. I'm always fascinated by that. Why they happen so often when driving and also why they always seem to direct you still in the direction that you're going in or mostly. It's not like you're taking one and you appear in a new country or in the ocean or outside in outer space. You know, it's all confined in this geographic area that makes sense to the person that experiences it. So something odd is going on there. It's not random. It seems intentional. Very curious. And also, just to reiterate, do not drive while you're tired. It's a great point to make, and not enough people realize just how impaired their senses and reaction time is when they're tired. I think if it was like if you uh, only got four hours of sleep, or it might have been two hours, I'm not sure, a, a very heavy lack of sleep, you, they compared that to the reaction times of someone that was heavily intoxicated, and they found that the person that was tired actually performed worse than the person that was drunk. That's really bad. Rest up before you go on the road. It's not something you can get marks on your driver's license for or uh, go to jail, because how do you test for that, you know? <laughs> you have to prove that you slept eight hours before you can go on the road. Obviously, it's not tenable to police that, but it's still something you can control in yourself, you know, and for your own safety, really. Sleep well. <laughs> and it's something that I struggle with myself. I try to at least get seven cups. And if it's absolutely unavoidable, I would say at least infuse yourself with like five cups of coffee. So get that uh, reaction time back up. <laughs> I think you could just take a reaction time test. That would help. There's also decision making that is impaired. So it's not just your speed of reaction. I know life is unavoidable sometimes and <laughs> I struggle with sleep all the time. And it's funny running this channel and helping so many people fall asleep, but I can't do it myself. If I can, I love sleeping, but I hate having to sleep, if that makes any sense. There's too much stuff to do and, you know, experience. I don't want to bother with sleeping. And then when I'm sleeping, it's amazing. And when I wake up, I don't want to wake up, but it's this repeating cycle. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. <laughs> and now time for the quote of the day. Lost time is never found again. Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, it's that, uh, ever-present grim reaper in the great distance, looming over us. I want to live forever. I don't know if that'll be scientifically possible within my own lifetime. And of course, you know, if we live in a simulation, maybe it doesn't even matter. Maybe I will just wake up and restart the game. I'd rather not risk it just in case it's not a simulation and, you know, there's no afterlife. I just want to figure out a way to maintain this body and mind to go on forever. That'd be cool. It's too many things to experience. Technically not forever. I don't want to be immortal to the sense where I can't die no matter what. Because eventually you reach the heat death of the universe. Dave is almost <laughs> Because eventually you reach the heat death of the universe. And then what are you going to do then? Just drift forever? Or be an absolute entropy? And you can't do anything? I want to have the ability to check out when I want to check out. And not have it just thrust on you. You know, arbitrarily. Because that kind of sucks. Too many places to go. And that's before we even unlock reasonable space travel. If we unlock that... Phew, well, literally, the universe becomes our ocean. The final frontier. Case notes are filed 10,014. My boyfriend mysteriously vanished and then reappeared? So it seems that you were entirely out of sync with your original universe. Perhaps multiversal peering. You were physically moved to a different reality, a different universe, temporarily. Not in quantum immortality because your entire body was there. Or at least your perception was. Maybe your soul took over someone else's body, a copy of yours, in a different universe. Temporarily. In that universe, your boyfriend wasn't home for some reason. Maybe you didn't even have one. But you returned to your original universe, and then when you returned, you weren't in the room. Your boyfriend was there in the bedroom, but you were maybe back in the kitchen area or somewhere else, where, wherever you were when you sent the text, and then you went to check the bedroom, and then he was there, because he was always there from his perspective in that universe. But the key is that you had to be back in your original universe when you sent the text. Otherwise, it wouldn't be on your boyfriend's phone. So the time delay between that is where you came back. Maybe a bit before that, but it couldn't be after. And I guess in this entire timeline of this glitch, this transposition between universes, you didn't feel anything. It's amazing to me that this entire process doesn't have any physical sensation. But then again, I guess the soul doesn't have pain receptors. Or like it can't feel queasy or get multiverse ocean seasickness. <laughs> I guess that's not a thing. <laughs> Case notes for file 10,015. The teriyaki sauce bottle that changed sizes. 
Yeah, perhaps just a displacement between universes again. Instead of a person, this is an object, a physical mass. From a different universe, you had a sauce bottle there that was a bit bigger. And in that universe, maybe you have a fridge that is slightly bigger. Or you put the sauce bottle in a different area in the fridge where it would fit over there. But in this universe, it doesn't fit because it's a bit too big. That seems to be the case. I can't imagine anything else unless the universe literally has an error where it forgot what the size of the bottle was supposed to be. But even then, you had it in your hand the whole time, right? It only took like 10 seconds to apply the sauce on your food. So you didn't feel it grow in your hand or anything like that. It just, it didn't change sizes. So that is altogether very odd. I guess if it just switched in your hand, maybe you weren't looking at it for that whole 10 seconds. In that brief moment where it was out of sight, maybe in your peripheral vision only, it increased in size from a different universe's version. The classic multiversal switcheroo. Also, I have to say, I like your name. These names these days. <laughs> People are creative. Case notes for file 10016. The Time Destroying Bathroom. Yeah, this is another one of those whole ensemble of glitch stories where multiple glitches are happening at the same time. So you have multiversal peering, or maybe an entire switch of universes where you saw this lady that wasn't actually there when you came out. So in that time frame, that short time frame, between being in the bathroom, seeing the lady, and then emerging later, you were in a different universe. Or you were just seeing the woman in the pink dress in another universe, and then when she left the bathroom, your perception returned to your original universe. But then you also later on lost time, and then when you emerged from the bathroom having lost time, your friends didn't remember the lady. So there was also a actual switch of universes involved, which also translated to some time loss. Which normally, there is no time loss. All the universes are running concurrently. So unless there was a lag period, where your soul wasn't inhabiting anything. Maybe you were stuck in a dead pocket universe where no one was around, but your memory was wiped of that. I think in those areas where people are transposed between universes, their soul has to actually travel there. And maybe if the universe is far away, there's a lag period. So in that period of time, it's like a loading screen, I guess you could say. They're in a dead pocket universe. But I don't think we're supposed to remember that. Sometimes people do, and they bring back remarkable stories of entirely dead worlds where no one else is there. So then you're in the new universe, and there was a time lag, so from your perspective, was a minute, because you don't remember the other nine minutes where you were in this dead pocket server. That's a whole ensemble of glitches going on, multiversal peering, and then a dead pocket server from quantum immortality, your soul jumping to a new universe, and then because of not remembering that dead server, you uh, lost time. That's uh, quite something to happen in a span of a, a few minutes. <laughs> Seems like you'll be okay. It's quite amazing what can happen to us in such a short amount of time and with no long-term implications. Apparently our souls are very robust, which is a very good thing. I'm glad about that. <laughs> and now time for the quote of the day. We judge others by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. Stephen Covey. Now isn't that true? Intention matters, so applying intention to our own parameters and choices in life is sensible. But we should include that in the factoring of other people. Are they being purely malicious if they do something bad? Or are there other exigent circumstances that should be taken into account? We do take that into account, I guess, in law. Like there's differences between murder or involuntary manslaughter, things like that. First degree murder, third degree, and so on. You know, if you plan it out versus acting in the heat of the moment. It's a different scenario, and there's different consequences for that because, you know, taking things from intent matters. But beyond just legal ramifications or insanely potent actions like murder or anything like that, if you're just talking about general day-to-day -day things, people's opinions about things. I think these days, especially over the last, I don't know, 10 years, the last decade, where people think that everyone else is only out for themselves, there's no benefit of the doubt. People don't steel man each other anymore. They straw man each other. And it's all just to win the game or something. You know, win the argument. I think we need to get back to taking each other's intentions into clear consideration. And yeah, maybe some people are actually just bad people. But even then, trying to understand their position can help in future encounters with other people. Case notes for file 10,017. A light bulb exploded. And then it was brand new. So this might be related to quantum immortality. 
if you touched uh, the circuitry of the light switch and maybe there was some exposed wiring somehow, which does happen in older systems or circuitry, people don't quite install them right. So there is some issues like that. There's some people that have uh, no paneling on the switch. There's just like the box sticking from the wall and there's a hole in the wall. So if that's the case in your situation, where there was some kind of exposure, maybe to uh, the actual circuitry of the light switch, then maybe, especially if your hand was wet, you touched it, and because your hand was wet, the resistance, the ohms, would be much lower. And then even the smaller amount of amps in that light switch circuit, you know, just 110 volts, because of the lowered resistance from your wet hand, that could result in death. Now, if that's not the case, if it was just a normal wall switch with nothing exposed and your hand wasn't wet, then I'm not sure. I wonder why it was tripped at all? Why did the light bulb explode to such a great degree? And if it's the case where it wasn't quantum immortality, it seems like a natural local reset of the light bulb. But why would the universe do that? Why would anyone care? Is it a developer in the simulation You're just looking over the parameters and saying, oh yeah, this light bulb exploded when it wasn't supposed to, so let's reset it. Why would that matter? It's just a light bulb. wonder if the cuts that you had, maybe the cuts would have killed you. Maybe you would have gotten an infection. Did the cuts disappear? If you were still cut, hmm, I'm not sure. This is a strange one for sure. It's like a localized time reset, but not time exactly. It's just the physical object repaired itself. Like the universe casted Reparo on it. How peculiar. But it's even beyond that because the glass shards still were there. So it's not just Reparo where they came back into themselves, reformed like Humpty Dumpty, put back together. No, they were duplicated. The mass was recreated from somewhere. That's not normal, because that should require an enormous amount of energy, even just for glass. Any physical matter has so much energy bound in a strong nuclear force, it's almost incomprehensible. A single feather could blow up an entire city if all the mass of it was converted instantly into energy at 100% efficiency. Even atomic bombs don't even come close to 100% efficiency. Case notes for the creepy file number 83. Secrets of the Deep Appalachian Mountains. Yeah, so obviously for me, UFOs, yay. <laughs> they always catch my eye. Stories revolving around UFOs, unidentified objects. Now, is it an alien? Maybe, maybe not. I'm sure the military is testing all kinds of weird experimental aircraft. The fact that it pursued you, but didn't seem to be able to catch up, kind of leads me more towards it not being alien. They would have caught up before you could even start the car or turn it around or whatever. Alien technology would be so far beyond us. It would be indistinguishable from magic. There's an extra quote of the day from Arthur C. Clarke. Sufficiently advanced technology would be indistinguishable from magic. Yeah, think about going back to the days of a caveman and bringing them a cell phone or tra talking about a computer or the internet or electricity or any of that. It would be like magic to them. They wouldn't even be able to comprehend it. We might be able to recognize that it's a ship, but how it functions, its propulsion systems, its ability to resist gravity, nullify it, invert it, to not account for g-forces, for any inhabitants of the ship, and so on. It's a different realm entirely. But yeah, just the idea of uh, the Appalachians is fascinating to me. Exposed wilderness that's almost untouched, and just tens of thousands of square miles of majestic, pristine wilderness is so cool. And what's out there? Mystery. Unexplored. You know, I would love to walk the entire trail that there is on the Appalachian mountain range. I think it's 2100 miles from West Virginia all the way to Maine. And apparently it takes people like half a year to walk it. <laughs> Obviously with a lot of camping and there's small towns nestled between the trails where you can walk off and just go stay in a hotel, take a shower and so on. If I did that, I wouldn't do it alone. I would definitely have someone else come with me. Doing it alone would be quite a undertaking. It would remove some of the magic. I mean, part of the magic of it and the thrill is taking on the world, traveling it with a companion. A lot of things coming in my life. A lot of adventures I've yet to embark on. And now time for the quote of the day. Sometimes, you never appreciate the value of a moment until it becomes a memory. Dr. Seuss. I mean, it's so important to appreciate the moment, isn't it? The present is called the present for a reason. It's literally a gift every single minute we're alive. You want that gift to endure, but the best you can do is just play the hand you're dealt and enjoy where you're at. Now obviously, if you're being tortured in some prison camp as a prisoner of war, it'd be difficult, but assuming your life is basic level decent, you know, appreciate that. I think uh, 
probably a good idea, and appreciate the moments you have with the people you love, because that's what really matters. Friends, family, acquaintances, even work colleagues. They all matter. They should, anyways. If you value them, and your actions show that, usually, it'll be reciprocated. And then, who knows what kind of adventures you'll get off to with them. Exciting times. Case notes are file 10,018. The world's coziest glitch. No, you shouldn't brush it off. It's not something you can just push to the side. Even though it's small, it's inexplicable. Short of the weirdest explanation, like someone broke in, stole your sweater, wore it for three months, and then brought it back. That doesn't make any sense. The only possible way I could try to explain this normally is one of your friends and family members came in, stole it, temporarily borrowed it, and then returned it. But that doesn't really make any sense to me. Is that something your friends and family would do? I don't think so. Short of that, it's just classic DOP. De-rendered from the universe and then reappeared on top of your laundry. The exact causes of de-render and reappearance is not, not known, but it is very clear that it happens often. Case notes are file 10,019. My dog is an imposter? I'm quite certain that your dog, your new dog, appreciates the no murder boundary setting discussion. It's important to be frank, right? Honest, clear about your expectations. No murder, and switching out occasionally with your real dog. Reasonable expectations, I would say. So in the comments, to further iterate your confusion, you mentioned that both gates were locked. So unless he somehow scaled the fence, went all the way around, scaled the other fence, and came back on that side, Maybe he's not a skinwalker, and he just encountered this random space-time anomaly where he teleported a small distance. If they can teleport people miles away, then why not a few feet? Never ceases to amaze me. In the distances and the locations, they're always specific to the individual or even the pet in this case, if that's what happened. They have to be intentional. And is someone just messing with you? Is this like a TikTok video from the real universe where people prank people in the simulation and they have like millions of views in the real world? I could see that. Case notes for the bonus file. My boyfriend's phone was stolen by Casper? Yeah, it's a mischievous little Casper you have on your hands and all these pranksters, these spirits, they embody me <laughs> if I die and become a fragment of a soul. Now, is it attached to you? Or maybe it's actually not just a prankster. Maybe it's a jealous ghost. Maybe you came into the picture, living with him in his house, and the ghost got jealous and wanted to have him all to him or herself. Maybe it's a female prankster-ish spirit. Could be. If it's a jealous person in real life before they die, then they would still be jealous as a spirit. So maybe they were attached to him in the house, not you. Or maybe it is attached to you and it's the same story. They're just jealous that now you're with some, someone else. And now time for the quote of the day. The master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. Stephen McCraney. We all have a history in our lives. All the trials and tribulations that we've faced. Part of those includes failures. You can't have success without failure. Virtually impossible. Don't let failure hold you down. Just embrace it, learn from it, and move on. You'll be better. And you have to do that to become a master. And don't fret. It's part of the natural journey. Case notes are filed 10,020. The multiverse is losing track of our things? My impression is that the universe operates on a point-based system of quantized energy. Electrons have their shells, and they can only operate in specific quantized versions or orbits. Discrete packets of energy like photons. Everything is packaged neat and tightly. So it makes sense to a computer to store information. Even though we can't get to that information, because observation from the simulation, anything inside of it, changes the state of whatever we're observing from above it, it may be possible that they can track everything. And maybe sometimes there's still errors. And because of those errors, there's things that can happen like this, where objects de-render, eventually they're found and corrected, and they reappear. That would be my guess in what's happening most of the time. I think it's possible that there's also intentional de-renders, maybe to mess with us, prank with us, maybe to affect our decision-making process in the moment. Things like that I think are quite common. But it's just information and corrective measures taken by the real world's supercomputer. Case notes are file 10,021. The never-ending supply of mac and cheese. You know, it's curious, even though m most people probably know I hate cheese now. As a kid, I didn't mind mac and cheese. Now, I can't do it, but maybe it's because they don't put much real cheese in it. It's mostly a fake powder. 
nutritious yeast. I don't know what they use. But yeah, it just tasted kind of salty, I guess. But yeah, I would say this is just another duplication of them. So de-render, reappearance, and duplication. The duplications probably apply from other universes, the multiverse, where copies of items in those universes are mistakenly restored, but only in the wrong universe, basically. And if that's true, then in another universe, there's a customer that didn't receive any watches at all. Then he's a, a bit annoyed because they just don't exist in that universe. Okay, so notes for the bonus file. My 200-year-old church is haunted. They say that if you have unfinished business, you're more likely to remain behind as a fragment. There's a stronger wave in the ocean that's left behind, so it'll still ripple out no matter what, but I think if the unfinished business is completed, then maybe the waves impact on the hard surface and dissipate more quickly. Something like that. You ever have like that imp uh, when you go on vacation or you travel somewhere far and you, you have in the back of your head, did I lock the door? Did I turn off the stove? Think of a, that as unfinished business, but just amplified, you know, a hundredfold or something. This desperate need to have closure in your life, something that you didn't complete or you missed or someone that you didn't say you loved or something along those lines. Well, this is what I expect is happening here with uh, spirits and ghosts. And of course, if the unfinished business, if you're a bad person, well, <laughs> the unfinished business could be something that's impossible to complete. Like if Hitler had a spirit lingering behind, we'd all hope that his spirit wouldn't be able to finish his uh, task, just fade away. I do wonder how it all ties together with quantum immortality, the afterlife, simulation theory, whatever ends up being true. Maybe there's all parts of it that are true and they combine into something different than what we expect. You could see multiple universes where, yeah, if you're a spirit, you're just a tiny fragment of their soul left behind, the imprint of who they were. Like if you're on a bed on a mattress that's soft and you get up, the mattress springs back, but it takes time. And I think that's, that's basically the idea of what I'm thinking a spirit is. And this one is very old, so maybe the imprint he left behind on the universe was very potent. And because of that, it takes a long time to fade away, to be restored. Now maybe, yeah, breaking down the old building will help to reset the mattress of the universe. I hope so. I hope uh, he finds his peace. And now time for the quote of the day. The mark of an educated mind. To entertain a thought without accepting it. Aristotle, it's how we can steal man other people's positions. I think the best way to argue and have discourse with other people is to try to understand their positions. I think a lot of people are afraid to do that now. They think that even, even conceiving of someone else's idea or position will somehow infect them. But that's a terrible mindset if you ask me. We have to be able to consider other possibilities, ideas, even if they're wrong, even if they're disgusting in some ways. Unless you're able to do that, then you're operating on a position that your current mindset and worldview and opinions are infallible. There's no possibility that anything else is correct. And so if you talk with someone else, you're not actually trying to have a discourse with them. You're just saying, I have to win. I have to beat them because they're wrong. There's no way they're not. It's a very dangerous mindset. And sadly, I think a lot of people are falling prey to it. How do you fix that? Case notes are filed 10,022. The pencil that controls the world. Okay, so be honest, if you saw a flying donkey just parading through the sky, the first thought would be, can I ride on it? Like a hippogriff? That would be my first thought anyways. That'd be fun. Just don't fall off. Isn't it cool how the universe's errors can often play into our favor? At least some copies of us in s certain universes. In another universe, probably the mechanical pencil case just vanished and then reappeared in this universe. For you... It's to your benefit. Small one, but still. But imagine if it was more notable or potent. All the gold in Fort Knox in one universe disappears and then reappears in our Fort Knox. So gold just duplicates, double. It's like the uh, Harry Potter scene in Gringotts where they touch a cup and it multiplies because of the Gemino curse, I think it was. Kind of like that, but in actual reality. Case notes for the bonus file. Unexpected inspection by my dead boss. That is an extremely dedicated boss, yeah. One final inspection before he departs the mortal coil. Or even within the last strands of the coil. <laughs> Make sure his workers are doing okay. Kind of respect that. But to be serious, that would be terrifying. To glimpse his soul just before or maybe just after he died. Dying in a car accident, maybe 
there was water involved, which is why he's pale. Or maybe it's just how he looked after, you know, I, we all die. We lose color in our skin because there's no blood flow. I, I would be freaked out, that's for sure. And I don't know if I could go back to work there. I mean, maybe I'd be okay and mellow out after a few weeks of not seeing him. But if it's a common reoccurrence, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Even if he doesn't have malicious intent. Like, even if he's just this dedicated boss that wants to manage his employees after death. Like, chill, bro. <laughs> this is too much. We can't handle that. At least Alex took pride in his work. That's one thing to say. And uh, may his soul rest in peace. Whatever little fragment is left. And now time for the quote of the day. You cannot conquer a free man. The most you can do is kill him. Robert Heinlein. Yeah, this gives me 1984 vibes, where the whole point of that was to control thought, control the mind, control the deeper element inside it, maybe the soul. You can kill someone, that's easy, very easy. But to really get into their mind and make them betray everything that they hold dear, every principle and thought that they cherish, well, that is truly to break a person, to destroy them entirely, much more than killing them ever could. If you make someone betray themselves... That's where they're wiped clean. Avoid that at all costs. No matter what happens to you. No matter what challenges come your way or what people say. Just be true to yourself. Case notes for file 10,023. My father is unbound by space-time. You know, if you ask your dad what he was thinking about when you called him, or maybe a few minutes before you called him, my guess is it was about you. I think this astral projection can happen sometimes for specific individuals, maybe if their mind is open to it. Usually their soul is drawn or pushed out towards what, what they're thinking about. Something important to them. Usually a person. And in this case, you. And not even necessarily thinking about you in the present moment, but just in a general sense. Maybe thinking about memories of you growing up or anything related to you. The soul would then gravitate, be drawn, maybe pushed, drawn towards the person where the memories are so connected and powerful. It's just metaphysical. The soul doesn't matter, doesn't care about distance. Four miles is like four plank lengths. It doesn't matter. It can go there instantaneously. Spooky action at a distance that Einstein would say with uh, quantum entanglement. Everything is connected in that sense where, yeah, you can't transmit information, but there is a pathway, like a highway, that can be traversed. Our souls can, at least. The other possibility, if it's not astral projection, is just multiversal peering. You were seeing your dad because he was either living with you in another universe or just visiting for the night. And he uh, obviously didn't hear you. He was just going down and maybe hungry, getting a snack from the kitchen. Something like that. Simple. Case notes for file 10,024. The dog with a grand secret. So is this a buffered glitch? A glitch in the buffer? If the universe is buffered ahead, the information's already there, we made our choices and we're just experiencing them again. Well, in that case, you played out the events twice for some reason, instead of just once. So now this would be the third time... And it was like a reset. But maybe not. Because it's not its not a total reset unless you lost... I guess you... If it was only a minute or two, maybe you wouldn't even have realized that time was lost. Maybe you repeated a couple minutes. That's a small enough time where you may not even have noticed. I mean, I don't necessarily know exactly what time it is right now versus in two minutes. So I could lose two minutes without really knowing. If I'm just, you know, hanging out in, at home or something. So maybe it was just a buffered reset. Now that said, the other possibility is, maybe your dog is really just that powerful, beyond anything we can possibly comprehend, and he's just biding his time. We should be on the lookout. Case notes for the creepy file number 84. An unearthly South Haven experience. So people have suggested this could be related to mimicry. A mimic can, of course, mimic appearances and sounds of people you know and love, like your father. And they try to do this to lure people into isolated areas and then kidnap them, torture them. I'm not sure exactly what the motive is, but whatever it is, I don't think it's anything good. So it's a good thing that you didn't go and you weren't drawn like the uh, mermaid, the sirens, the ocean siren. My impression is it's more than just that. I mean, if a mimic is there, does it create this atmosphere over an entire town of despair and anxiety? Like you describe feeling this great unease just by being there. So it seems like there's an actual presence beyond just a mimic. Maybe there is also a mimic, but there's something even higher level than that. And you know this because as soon as you left, you instantly describe feeling better. So there was actually like this hanging, looming cloud over the town. I wonder if anyone else felt that. 
Maybe looking up the uh, Facebook group for that town. Maybe people speak about that. Maybe people who live there are so used to it, they don't even realize anything's wrong. Maybe if they go for a vacation, they rest. damn, things feel better out here. What's going on? <laughs> and now time for the quote of the day. The earth is the cradle of humanity. But humanity cannot remain in the cradle forever. Konstantin Tilkovsky. Damn, do I love this quote. And it applies not just to humanity as a whole, although at the abstract, the higher level, you can just think of, yeah, we need to leave the planet. We can't just be a single planet species. If you really want to get out there, well, we've been to the moon once, presumably, all right? Uh, let's go to Mars. Let's see what's out there. Now, it takes such a long time, but there's ways around it. We have the technology. We could literally build a spaceship right now. Well, first we build a, lo a base on the moon and then bring materials up there slowly. And then we can build a larger spacecraft in the low gravity around the moon. And from there, we can build a, a spacecraft that is uh, capable of rotation, internal rotation, to create the, uh, well, the effect of gravity effectively. For those living on the ring that is uh, rotating around itself, uh, around a central axis point. If you rotate at a, I mean, I don't know the exact math right now, but depending on the size of it, you wouldn't actually need uh, extremely fast rotation. So then things could remain mostly normal in terms of human perception. That would eliminate the problems on the human body of low gravity. Even though astronauts in the International Space Station, they work out religiously, like every single day, hardcore. It's not enough to reduce the muscle loss, the atrophy of the muscles and the, um, the bones. Coming back to Earth is a nightmare if they spend any uh, notable amount of time up there. So we could build a spacecraft that has that. We could build a spacecraft that is surrounded in a harder shell that is layered with a lot of water to absorb the cosmic rays. We could even build a uh, EM generator on the spacecraft to mimic the magnetosphere of the Earth that protects us from solar radiation, because that's the other concern right now that astronauts have. Any prolonged voyage would result in a lot of radiation for anyone aboard, unless we shield it. But that's the thing, we can. We have the technology to do all this. It's just a question of will and, of course, money and time. But it's, it's theoretically possible. We could absolutely go to Mars. And I know Elon Musk wants to do it. I think it's a bit ambitious. I think a uh, lunar base is the first step. So you can actually build a reliable craft that could do it in a way that, you know, doesn't harm the people aboard. They can remain relatively sane, experience gravity, the effect, and uh, be protected from solar radiation, all that good stuff. But yeah, we can do it. I think within maybe three decades, we could have a base on Mars. Cool stuff, man. Can't wait. Case notes for file 10,025. An entire building vanished without a trace. So first off, you're not crazy. Seriously. This happens all the time. And it seems so wild, but it does. I'm thinking of the show Counterpoint, where there's this character that sees himself, and he realizes, finds out eventually, he's from a different parallel universe. Now, there's whole technology and machines to traverse between it, but in our universe that, that we occupy, in the multiverse we occupy, all we need is our soul. Now, to directly control it, we haven't figured out that, that part yet, but we experience it all the time. We don't necessarily travel the whole way with our physical bodies, it's just the soul. We just see into other universes, or other universes bleed into us. It's kind of like vast ocean, and we have a ship sailing through it. Sometimes we're able to spot great in the distance with our looking glass, and we can see things that aren't normally supposed to be there. We don't really control where we're going though. The ocean currents and wind just take us along. So in a nutshell, the building that you saw really existed in reality, but in a different universe. In your universe, there's a clock tower, and in another universe, there's some weird gray white building with a big box and wires on top. I don't know, some radio tower? Seems odd. I'm more curious what the building was about. Maybe that universe that you saw into was a dystopian version, like in 1984 or something. Hopefully not, but... Kind of sounds like the type of buildings it would have. They call it brutal architecture. Case notes are filed 10,026. An impossible call. You know the oddest part about all this? Well, at least <laughs> one of many is the fact that you heard the phone ringing even though your phone was on a silent. I've had my phone, I have several phones, and I always put it to silent because I don't like hearing noises that distract me or when I'm recording or whatever. So it's always on silent and I've never had the phone make any noise unless I turn off the silent mode. Outside of an actual alarm, those still go off, but obviously your ringtone isn't an alarm, so I don't know why it would happen. That is very strange. Of course, the fact that you FaceTimed him when you were still sleeping, or 
slightly woken up from a weird whisper. Was it your boyfriend's mind connecting to yours, thinking about you so you heard a whisper? But then how did you FaceTime it? There was a clear record in the phone itself. That's harder to say. Unless there's multiversal shenanigans going on with a different cell phone from a different copy of the universe. I mean, maybe. And now time for the quote of the day. We would worry less about what others think about us if we realize that they seldom do. Ethel Barrett. Yeah, it makes me think about all those people that are afraid of going to the gym. If they're currently out of shape or overweight or whatever, what actions are they taking to improve their lives? If you're overweight but you're going to the gym all the time and working hard, and all, you know, diet is another thing you don't see, but if you have the will to continue and persist, not just for a week, I think that's tremendously awesome. It's clear that people don't really care about, you know, what you're doing unless you're harming others. You just go about your day. It doesn't really matter. You'll be fine. Case notes for file 10,027. The glitchiest snow day ever. So maybe this is in part why I love snow so much now, is back in the day, as a in middle school and one year of high school, because I was homeschooled after that, I would have snow days. And they were infrequent. Maybe I had five in my life, something like that, because I was living in Quebec, Montreal, or outskirts of Montreal, the suburbs areas. Not exactly a place that's unaccustomed to snow, so they had entire fleets of snow plows and salters and everything, so it was rare there was so much snow that there was a school was cancelled. But in the days that they were, it was so cool. The best times, the uh, best days of my life. <laughs> if you've never experienced a snow day, you wouldn't know. But uh, yeah, they're, they're good. If they're unexpected, especially. And it's like those memes where, you know, your parents had to go to school by walking 30 miles through a blizzard while also being in a, a desert snowstorm <laughs> and a sandstorm and a heat wave. And, you know, they, they were walking through space. And <laughs> they had a hard life, right? Uh, we didn't have to do that. You know, if it was snowy enough, we just stayed home, which was pretty cool. Now to the glitch, I think it all starts with the dream state. We don't fully understand why we dream. I mean, we understand some mechanisms. We repair our bodies more when we're asleep. You know, physical repair, but also mental organization. It's like thinking of um, an old school magnetic disk hard drive where there's a need to defragment it to organize and partition things more closely. And also the brain clears out short-term memories that are thought to not be needed. So there's a lot, of go lot going on in your mind, and your mind is more active when you're sleeping than when you're awake. Most people think it's the other way, but it's not. So perhaps there were synapses that were arranged in such a configuration while you were sleeping that enabled you to decode the buffered reality, the information of the future that already happened, the choices you already made and were living through again, and you just grabbed that information and your brain was able to process it in terms of more of an emotion instinct to know what's going to happen like with the dishes. It's not really a thought, like a, a vision of what was going to happen, you just knew and you reacted in that way because of that. I think that's pretty cool. I think there's a lot to learn about dreams and what our minds are capable of. I think there's so much information around us that we don't have access to. Not entirely. And because of that, sometimes in dream states, we're able to unlock more. It seems like it only lasted for a day, though. I wonder, maybe when you went to bed the following night, the brain reset back to normal. Case notes for file 10,028. Playing in the universe's rubble. So generally, if we're talking about astral projection, the person that is projecting their soul out, their soul isn't naked. They appear to be clothed, and usually they're wearing whatever the person is wearing at the time of astral projection. So if you mention that the kid you saw looked just like yours, but was wearing red instead of yellow, as he physically was when you saw him again later on, and then your brain was able to process that difference, because in the moment everything happened so quickly. So he was wearing a different shirt. So to me, I don't think it was astral projection. I think it probably was more multiversal peering. You were just seeing into an another universe where your son in that universe was playing in the rubble. And maybe uh, you were preoccupied with something else and he was just being a sneaky boy, you know, doing boy things, which is just taking unnecessary risks. That That's what we do. <laughs> And it's fun, you know, as long as we don't actually get hurt. I know uh, <laughs> I climbed so many trees, you know, really, really big trees to the tippy top where it was uh, so thin that the branch was uh, moving. And I've, some branches broke and I fell down and I was a small kid, so I never really hurt myself. I mean, uh, just a few things. I broke my middle finger. That was an accident in a door. But uh, outside of that, just, you know, scrapes and bruises and stuff like that on my bike going down hills, all the good stuff. 
But yeah, boys will be boys. We will take risks because it's fun. It's got to explore the world, right? Or in this case, the courtyard because it's not explored yet. There's uh, something new there. Maybe treasure mixed in with the rubble. <laughs> and now time for the quote of the day. Your actions speak so loudly, I can't hear what you say. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Oh yeah, another Emerson quote. Seems to have a pretty good mind on his shoulders, at least uh, for some snippets. This one thing I always find fascinating is no matter who the person is, even if they're like actual evil or just someone you disagree with, they're probably going to have some nuggets of wisdom that you can uh, embody and uh, work with. It's worth listening to everyone. You never know what they'll say. I mean, our actions are us. You know, all the machinations going on inside our brains are the trials and errors that are going on in our mind trying to determine who are we going to be in the next choice that we make. And that's what really matters. You know, our, our intent matters, but ultimately actions are what speak for us. We are our actions, our choices, our imprint on the universe and on other people. Maybe you're not bad, but you're not doing anything good either. You know, you can be neutral, I guess, but might as well strive to be good too. <laughs> Case notes for file 1029, the most ominous ball in the universe. So this, along with that tiny dot in the space-time continuum, the rip in the universe, you know the few stories where there's this ball that shouldn't be there. And in those cases, there are actual floating black orbs, a rip in the space-time. This one freaks me out too, though. Both of them are terrifying in their absurdity and their impossibility in the universe. Like how you describe all the options in your story, there's no way the ball, this red ball, should be in your basement. It simply was there when it wasn't supposed to be. To me that screams, yeah, was transposed from a different universe. These things shouldn't be happening, but they are, frequently. I think tossing it away was the right move. Case notes for file 1030. Welcome to the universe. We got fun and games. Sometimes return to the classic glitches is good. There's no handcrafted brioche buns or garlic aioli or anything like that. It's just classic hamburger. Lettuce, tomato, mustard, ketchup, <laughs> salt, and pepper. This is how I would categorize this glitch. It's just classic quantum immortality. Nothing wrong with it. And kind of delicious. I hope you enjoy your freshly served quantum immortality. Welcome to the new universe. Case notes for the creepy file 85. Black eyes of horror. You know, a lot of people don't like pit bulls, and I can't exactly blame them. There are a lot of issues that pit bulls have. They're, they can be more aggressive. It also just comes down to how they were trained as uh, pups. But still, in this case, you can't deny the uh, reputation of pit bulls kind of saved you by the description of this man. I don't think he had any good intention seeing that dog. Like, oh, yeah, I can uh, kidnap these two girls. No, no problem. Ah, oh, damn, there's a dog. Ah, they're just, they're just so nasty. Yeah, nasty to you, buddy. It's very creepy that he somehow managed to get in front of you, though. Maybe he knew a shortcut. Or was he actually a human being? Was he something else? Case notes for the bonus file. The little girl crying by the pond. Energy vampires, skinwalkers, mimics, beasts of danger roaming the woods, sirens of the sea. There are so many types of stories out there in legend, folklore, and they all really describe beasts or entities that are intent on luring people in one way or another through beauty or a cry of help from some boy or girl. Whatever it is, they're playing on the good nature of people or just their common nature in general, like uh, the sirens of the sea. Those sailors are in for a rough landing. <laughs> My impression is they want to siphon off from our metaphysical energy, our good nature, you could say. I think they see us as having the soul, something they don't have, and they want to tap into that power. It's like tapping into the trunk line of a power station, directly feeding into the energy, drawing that voltage. And it, of course, drains us. Best never to approach that. Always reminds me of the Dementors in Harry Potter. I think J.K. Rowling kind of borrowed from that folklore idea of entities that will drain your soul or drain your happiness from you. They aren't out there to give you happiness, that's for sure. And now time for the quote of the day. Be humble because you are made of the earth. Be noble because you are made of the stars. A possible Serbian proverb. I quite like this. Yeah, you should both be humble and reflecting on your nature as a human being. You're not a god. But at the same time, appreciate the vast wonder that's within you, within all of us. And not just purely by what we're made of. Yeah, we're manufactured as mass from the center of stars. That's cool. But more... Notable is our sentience, the fact that we can appreciate the universe. The universe 
doesn't really have any value outside of people that are or entities that are able to comprehend it, to perceive it, to witness its wonders. Without us, without sentience, there's nothing there. I think that's where I fall. I value sentience above everything else. I don't know if that's directly from a soul, a religious entity, you know, is it God that infuses us with the soul? Is it a simulation? Is it kind of like both? God just created a simulation? In a certain sense, you could say, yeah. Why not? Maybe it's a computer. Maybe it's not like God is just some programmer that, you know, wrote the code and created us like a Sims, very advanced Sims. I don't know. It's certainly fun to wonder about. Case notes are file 1031. The Omniscient Homeless Man. So this is interesting. Apparently in the comment thread, there are people that know about um, a very well-known, famous homeless man in New York City. Well, he was homeless. He's not anymore. They call him the Radio Man. And he's famous for always being in the spots where people are filming video or films, TV shows and such, like actual production companies doing it. No one really knew how he wound up in those places. Was it just a coincidence, lucky accident, or does he have like an inside connection? <laughs> seems like it's more than that because obviously in your, your case you were just filming some random very low budget film that no one knew about. So how did he know? Was it just random happenstance? Could be, but certainly hard to appreciate how he could know the actual intimate details of the movie you're producing. I mean, who knew? <laughs> Besides you guys. The information must just be out there and his mind is tapping into it. Case notes for file 1032. The universe gave us a wink. So Einstein would say that the universe, there aren't any coincidences, or God doesn't play dice with the universe. In this case, the dominoes would have to fall so precisely in so many ways for this to align. It's quite remarkable indeed. Now yeah, there are coincidences that happen every day, we can't discount that, but it still, to me, seems more than just random coincidence. Maybe indeed, the universe, God, the simulations, the developers, the <laughs> spaghetti, flying spaghetti monster wanted to give you a little sign, like hint, eh? You know, more is going on here. Maybe you needed to believe that for some reason. It all comes back to the butterfly effect, where even the tiniest thing, tiniest event, like a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil, can cause a hurricane or a tornado in Ohio or Florida. It all comes back to that because of the innate chaos of the universe. So many variables that aren't exactly random. To actually predict the future, you would have to know every variable at such a precise level that it's impossible. It's why they call it chaos theory. And that's what weather is. The further, <laughs> the further out you go, it's unpredictable. Even a couple days becomes uh, loosely predictable. But in a lot of ways, I think that's awesome. I think it means that every single one of our actions, even the tiniest ones, can have a monumental impact on the entire course of the human history, of the planet's history. So never feel like you're too small to make a difference. You're not. Case notes for the Nutella file. 1033. The Grandma with Unlimited Power. Yeah, again, it just comes back to that point where there are coincidences, but this is stretching the line, let's say. I don't know what it would be though. Just multiversal peering, maybe? Because I don't think it could be astral projection. You wouldn't, someone wouldn't project an entire car, you know, exactly how they drive it with the air fresheners dangling from the mirrors. That's not possible, from my understanding. So, it's not astral projection. I don't think it would be a doppelganger driving the exact same car as your grandma. So, the only thing I can think of is multiversal peering. Just a different universe where your grandma wasn't on vacation at that moment. Just driving on the highway. Even then, though, it's still quite a coincidence to be driving alongside her. So, no matter how you stretch it, this is remarkable and, and kind of incredible. I think the only real solution is that your grandma went to Hogwarts. Lucky. Very lucky. And now time for the quote of the day. Never give up, never surrender. Commander Taggart. If you haven't seen Galaxy Quest, go watch it. It's a great spin, you know, kind of parody of Star Trek, but in a serious, like, serious parody. But I think the quote is accurate. You shouldn't give up. Never. No matter what's happening, keep pressing on. Like the many the, the quote or the story from a while ago, maybe in the next few hits of um, the rock face, you'll find a gold vein. Your future self deserves your perseverance right now. <laughs> That's my quote. Case notes are file 1034. I was teleported by the winter goddess. Aliens, hell yeah. Winter aliens this time. Car all alone at night, desolate area, prime hotspot for alien activity, and plenty of sightings and encounters reported in Alaska. Usually it does involve more than 10 minutes of missing or misplaced time, 
I think given the location and everything just going on in the environment, I think there's no real question that it was an alien anomaly. Yeah, maybe it was just some space-time warping. It's possible. Normally it goes forward, not backwards, but I'm gonna go with aliens just because it's more fun. Wait a second. I forgot Dave. <laughs> he was right there. I took a, a sip of Dr. Pepper and I forgot to <laughs> put him back on my head. It still does beg the question, though. What are aliens after? Why do they care about some random person driving on a road in Alaska at night? We may never know, but I'll keep asking the question. Case notes are file 1035. The universe went grocery shopping for me. So imagine this isn't actually a glitch, and it's actually just the unlikely explanation at the end there. There's some random opposite of thief, a uh, general Santa Claus. So he comes in and breaks in just to, what, test his ability to break into people's homes and then brings in uh, peas with him? It doesn't make any sense. No one does that. If, if someone was going to break in and leave something behind, it would be as a threat. They used to do that all the time in the Soviet Union, to mess with people's minds and try to gaslight them, like rummage through someone's drawers for clothes and just leave a pair of uh, underwear on their bed or something like that. Just to mess with them, like make you think, why are they doing that? What's the point? Did I do something wrong? I guess the universe is gaslighting you now, which probably is better than a tyrannical government agency. There's that, silver lining. Case notes are file 1036. To repeat. So as I understand it, Vardigir is like a déjà vu but in reverse. So it happened, an entire pattern recognition that just recompiles itself, you could say. I think most likely it's just buffered reality. We're dealing with an event that was going to happen, and the universe knows that the information was stored there. For some reason, it played it ahead of time. And this would make sense if the buffered reality isn't like one continuous film. It's localized in different regional blocks. That way, time anomalies can make more sense, because everything is in its own reference frame, and can be altered or replayed in this case. Really cool, but definitely disconcerting. And now time for the quote of the day. I can resist everything, besides temptation. Oscar Wilde. And this is what I say after I finish an entire box of a dozen donuts. I couldn't resist temptation. What can I say? I can just say that. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. See you soon.